Hi, welcome to Artcasters number 124. Um, this is the weekly art show that alternates between myself and Scott's uh, Scott Circling channel. And uh, we usually have like a rotating third guest chair. And our guest this week is Chris Kawagua. So why don't why don't you start it off, Chris? Where where can we find your work? Sure. Uh, you can find me at chriskawagua.com. But they don't even know me yet. What if it? What if it's all terrible? <laughs> That's a good out. point. You can find out. But if you're if you're a gambling person, you should go check it out. It's a uh, Sketchboy zero one on pretty much everything: Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, nice. It's easier to spell than my name. So yeah, Sketchboy zero one on all the social medias. But yeah, awesome. Mm -hmm. And uh, Chris, like just uh, for the viewers and stuff, Chris and I go back to like early college um, and. You know, he's just like an incredibly skilled illustrator, storyboard artist, uh, graphic designer, t-shirt designer, book designer, like um, excellent just uh, illustrator. And we'll get into a lot of that and stuff and give you more of a taste. But at this time, take a gamble and go to that site. <laughs> um, Scott, uh, where can we find your work? Well, if my lower third was working, I'd just point to that, but it's not. And plus, if my video is still grainy like it has been for the past three episodes, which I don't know why, but uh, you probably couldn't read that anyway. So anyway, so yeah, just go to CircWorks.com or I'm at CircWorks on YouTube, S-E-R-K-W-O-R-K-S, -E and that's where you can find me. Nice. And you can also find him at, at Video Camera um, Security Footage. I'm just kidding because <laughs> it looks artifacted. Um, but yeah. Um, so uh, so the cool thing about um, Chris being on the show today, and Scott obviously already has a ton of experience with this, me less so recently, um, something that you do a lot as a cartoonist is like hitting conventions. And we've addressed conventions on the show before, but I feel like it's a topic that I want to hit again. Um, I think it's timely for, for you, Chris, because you're going to be at WonderCon tomorrow. Which tomorrow, yeah. <laughs> it's... Uh... Yeah, 24 hours. I gotta be hitting the road. I mean, it's not that far. It's gonna be in Anaheim, but uh, yeah, WonderCon's a great show. So it's starting tomorrow this weekend. Nice. And so, like, yeah. I thought it'd be good to kind of touch base because you're probably, you know, already mid preparation and stuff like that. And so <laughs> it's probably fresh on your mind. And then um, stuff back here. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually packing up the stuff right now. Nice. And then Scott um, is just like, you know, you have Phoenix, like you're going to be a guest at Phoenix and, uh, and you also are just like incredibly way more um, professional and kind of put together than I ever was at conventions. And, uh, and both of you guys are really um, polished and kind of have different tactics and techniques at conventions. And I think that's really useful um, because if I think back to like when I was first uh, going to conventions, I had no idea what I was walking into. I did everything wrong, you know? Um, and I think I, at the time, you know, I probably had that false perception that you just kind of sit at the table and draw your pictures and people just come and give you money, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and there's a little more to it to, to kind of sales tactics. There's booth display, all of that stuff. So I kind of thought that would be a good thing for us to dip into. For, for anybody like in our group that does conventions and wants to improve it, um, wants to improve their performance at conventions, or just like, you know, people who haven't even hit a convention yet and are like, what do I do? So, um, so Chris, like, um, the, one of the great things about you doing the topic of conventions is I've convention with you. Yeah. And I've seen it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I've seen it very effect, like a very effective, um, uh, convention like table run by you and mm -hmm. I think there's I mean obviously there's a lot that comes to play that isn't something you could have as just sales tactics or right. setup which is you have good art you know <laughs> so that's a huge that's a huge asset to it right um, and you know but but I think there's some techniques and some things you do that I've seen you like in the process of doing and really admired and so I kind of wanted to know like what why don't we why don't we just kind of start with like what your first convention experience was like and what have you learned kind of throughout the amount of conventions you've done and boothing right. you've done? Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 sure. I think um, cool. I always forget when I first started because every time you fill out an application form, it asks you like where you've tabled before, you know? 
and I always kind of lose track. I think it's maybe eight years, maybe 10 years. I don't know. But my first convention for sure was was Ape in San Francisco. And I don't know if uh, people remember when it was still there, but it was uh, it's it's all part of San Diego Comic Con. You know, they, they do San Diego and they do WonderCon and used to be Ape, which was the small press one, you know, the alternative press expo. And that that one, I remember my friend, but well, you know Ralph, like he he basically kind of kind of conned me into going by putting my name on the sheet. And <laughs> yeah, like I wasn't really, I was definitely on the fence about it. So this is one of those things where like, you know, um, you're kind of peer pressured in a good way to do something yeah. that you're afraid to do. So if you've never done it, I highly recommend, you know, doing it with a friend and just kind of splitting a table because it really helps cut costs and you don't have to feel like you're there by yourself. Because that's that's definitely super difficult for people who, if you're not used to being out in the public, and if you're spending a lot of spending a lot of time at, at the desk, you know, which you should be as an artist, you know, but um, when it comes time to presenting your work, if you might not be super familiar with that or comfortable, it really helps to have a friend. And so, like when we did it, it was super fun, right? Like it was the vacation, but you're also working. But even if it's slow, you're still hanging out with a buddy. And I also think that that if nothing's really happening, people can still just kind of like. I think people are attracted to people who are having fun and you're going to be having more fun if you're with a friend, you know, if you're telling each other jokes and laughing, people are going to be much more at ease and like, well, I'll browse this stuff. There's no pressure. They look like they're just hanging out, you know? Yeah, for um, sure. Yeah. So I think it was really helpful when I first started at Ape that I was splitting a table with, with two other people. So it was just taking one third of a, of a table, which is kind of funny to think about because now I take up, I mean, I do small press now at uh, San Diego Comic Con. And that's still not enough space. Like uh, my wife and I have combined our things together, and we have like a bunch of stuff that you have to basically curate now at this point with what you want to show. Um, but I first started with just three prints that I printed at home on my printer onto just nice watercolor paper, and I barely brought any stock. I was just like, I don't know if anybody's gonna want these. I made these things. Do you want them? And and when somebody first said they want to buy something, I, I was kind of not sure what to do. <laughs> I was like, what, what do I do? I, I, I don't think I had changed. I, had, I was totally ill-prepared, you know? Yeah. Really prepare for anybody, anybody's reception. So when it was actually like somebody actually wanting something that, that wasn't a friend of mine or a family member, you know, that, that's, it's a nice thing. And I think it definitely feeds back into the um, enthusiasm to make something because, again, you're spending a lot of time by yourself working on this stuff and rarely out in the public eye, you know? Yeah. And I think that's a really good... Uh, thing that you're touching on about like sort of being approachable like mm -hmm. it, which I think is kind of what that comes down to like with the, the the friendly thing or having a friend and having fun at the convention yeah because I don't know like um, for me and it, like I'm saying this in retrospect my first time conventioning I didn't really think of it at from the viewpoint of somebody even though I was somebody who had been to conventions yeah and knew what affected my ability to approach a booth. I hadn't really thought about it objectively about myself for right. my first one, you know? Yeah. And and that's that's a huge thing, like being approachable, because if you've ever been to a convention where there's a really talented artist that maybe you even want to approach and buy stuff from and they seem kinda of like awkward or pissed off or something. Or, or tense basically, basically, you know, like I think that's yeah. people can sense tension. I always feel like even if it's not super outwardly, like you don't have to make in a scowling face, but like how you hold your shoulders can make a difference with, with people feeling like this person's at ease. And yeah, they're, yeah. it's not gonna break their heart if I don't buy anything, which is, that's how I always feel, you know, like, and I purposely go out of my, like now that I've been on the other side of the table for so long, if I find somebody timid, I try to like engage them in something that's friendly and low key and, and basically just getting to know somebody rather than, that's that's the funny thing. Like you say that I'm good at this stuff, but like I never thought there was a method to it, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. I just came out of my shell and just was more able to talk about this thing that I like doing, or yeah, or share in a shared love of something, which as a nerdy person, everybody has, you know? And yeah, for sure. It's almost like a byproduct where they get to know you as a person, and then like, oh well, if it's good stuff, then you want to help your friends, and I I do that. Like I have patrons that like I'm, I'm I want to see them do well, you know? So like. Like I'll, I'll, I'll like um, I want to encourage that. And I think I kind of see both sides of it now. But I did, definitely didn't at the beginning. You know, definitely don't oh, yeah. how much you're putting your your heart on the table and saying, "Do you like this?" You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
But yeah, yeah, so like, you, yeah, it was. That's it, funny. I didn't know Ralph signed you up. Like, yeah, yeah. And he told me, and I forgot. Honestly, like, he's done it a couple times. Yeah, it was basically just like, oh, by the way, I put your name in the thing, and uh, so it's gonna like, make a liar out of me, or you know, a coward. So I'm gonna just gonna do this. <laughs> so rad. But yeah, sometimes it helps to have somebody that kind of pushes you in the right direction to to get outside your comfort zone. And uh, yeah. yeah, so we're we're both gonna be at WonderCon. So Ralph Ralph Miranda is his name. You should check his stuff out too. Really yeah, cool. he's a super talented cartoonist and a uh, friend of ours as well. Um, okay. Scott, what was what was your kind of first? What was your first convention like? Was it like a, a wild success, or uh, was it? Um, well, let's see. The first convention was a smaller convention, and it was sort of a, a themed convention, and it was like a first time show. Um, so it was it kind of just sort of dipped my toes into that. Um, and it was a good experience. I'm show very small. It's a uh, huge success. Full experience. But I think that the first time I ever exhibited mention uh, was at the Artist Alley and uh, did really well at that time. I had parody stuff, um, which I don't really do. You know, that, that recognizable characters and everything. Uh, uh, it, 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 then based on that, I said, well, ooh, man, I, I made a pretty decent sized profit from this little table. Maybe I should move out into the, you know, the big exhibitor hall. And so I did, uh, you know, I said, but, wasn't as much, but I think part of it was because I started phasing out all that and just concentrating on my own stuff and branding it. And um, it's kind of a hard road to uh, Satria in the, in the, the... Scott, Scott, sorry, I'm sorry yeah. to cut you out. Um, you're starting to kind of robot, robot out a yeah. little bit. I, could, I, could, yeah. I got bits and pieces, but I wasn't sure. Yeah, so I mean, the gist <laughs> so of what I... If yeah. we could decipher what you said. I yeah. don't know, am I coming in okay? The voice Yeah, chat yeah perfectly. Yeah. So you, you said you started out doing a lot more uh, fan art things, but you started to kind of curate your own like original content things. Correct. Yeah, that's a, that's a bold move because that's kind of where I'm definitely like trying to pivot, and it's a really difficult thing because it's such an easy way to grab attention is when you have something that somebody already recognizes. Yeah. Right? But like that's when you're really making the bold move is that you show something that is not related to anything else. And it's more a part of you than anything else, you know. Like it's not just a shared love of something, but something you actually put in a lot of sweat into, and then seeing if people like it, you know. Which, like, I have my own comic series, and it's super slow going, but I appreciate ten times more when people like that more than a fan art thing or something that's like my interpretation of something that's already existing. I think yeah. that's really good. Yeah, it's. Uh, oh yeah, I mean, I think um, like. Like Chris and I, like Chris, you and I discussed this like multiple times, like off of this show. But it's like to me that um, that falls in line with kind of my ambitions for like when I do get back to this is is sort of, and I've talked about that, like wanting to really test the waters and just go full bore and only have stuff that relates to my own property. Mm -hmm. But but it's it is one of those things where you've you've had these experiences of like just cleaning house like like not in an i don't know if that's the right terminology but doing really kick ass at sales sure. at a convention yeah and so like the the like like making that transition is not only a bold move it's a it's a pretty big risk because mm -hmm. you're you're possibly losing a mass amount of income that you could get not massive but but a decent profit Right, relative to oh, it, it's a much safer rate, safer route to go. Yeah, if you're just doing fan art, you know. But I think like I definitely applaud it, and I try to support it when I see it too. When I see it at tables, and somebody's got a comic, especially a comic, because I know how long it takes to make something, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, and the price points are so much lower. It's just one of those weird things where prints have a higher perceived value, even though they took much less work, you know. And they have a lower, they have a lower investment. Yeah, to make, yeah it's like, it's, dude, your book is taking how long? Like years of yeah. your life, you know? But I think it's like, when it's complete, it's its own thing. And I don't know if there's the same appreciation because like I think, like the single image, 
Although yeah. it doesn't, I'm not saying it's devalued, but the sheer amount of time you put into a single image versus an arrangement of a dozen images times 22 pages for a single issue, you know, like that's so much more than uh, you could possibly spend on one single image. And then the price point is so much higher, you know? So, gotcha. Uh, yeah. You know. Yeah, I think, um, I think that's, that's a, that's a cool thing. And, and it's interesting because that's something I wouldn't have known going into a convention cold either. Mm -hmm. Like when I first started, I literally just had like one book to sell. And that's like, yeah. pretty, I think that's pretty much all I had at my table. That was known, right? When you, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, and, uh, you were at that show. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. I helped yeah. you read the boxes. It was fun. Yeah. yeah. It was, that yeah. was an interesting time. We stayed in the seediest hotel in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, so we all piled into like this old car that, that was my car, I think. Right. That, that we took up there. Was it? And, yeah, uh, it was. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. And it was like, I mean, it's like one of those like early college cars that's just falling apart <laughs> and we all just kind of piled yeah, in. It's just enough to get to the, to the next place, you know, like, but, uh, yeah, yeah. and so we all just piled in and, and kind of took this long road trip and luckily i you know um I've, I've talked about this on the on the show like there's there's certain friends that i've had um since college that are like key really important people with um where i've ended up as an illustrator and stuff like that and like the fact like there's a there's a couple people like and you're one of them that hey, like hey, even hey. in that first um that first kind of walking in like you were saying about ralph like signing you up like mm -hmm. for me the fact that you and and but my now wife i guess i should say my ex-girlfriend now wife <laughs> <laughs> now, but, but um but like at the time like that that was so cool to have because it did make it more fun right. it, yeah, did, it, was... it did kind of make the experience more exciting because yeah. your first time at a convention you also meet all these other creators and mm -hmm. it's for somebody like me who felt like I was kind of making these things in a vacuum, mm -hmm. um, save like you and maybe like one other person in our program, like not a lot of people were doing comics at the time. Mm -hmm. So it was like, it was such a weird thing to just be like surrounded by all these people who make comics and they're talking to you like a peer. Right. And, um, I, I do remember my first time conventioning also in the back of my head being like, they're going to figure out that I just printed this book and like, I'm not, uh -huh. I, you know, and then you start talking to other cartoonists and start realizing, Oh, that's, that's what this, that's, that's actually everybody. what, right. Yeah. That's how you make books that yeah. are printed. <laughs> like, yeah. You don't, you don't, yeah. There's no asking for permission to do this thing. You just go out and do it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, that was your, to your credit, though, that was a <laughs> that was an award-winning Zarek book, you know. So like, it's not just that you made this on your own in a vacuum. It was at least it had some accolades connected to it, you know. Yeah, for sure. But, but, but was, it, it's cool. But I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I still get the same idea. You know, the the feeling stays the same. I think like the doubt is no matter how amazing your work is, you're still going to have a little bit of like, is this as good as the next guy? You know. Yeah, I think. I think what happens, at least for me, my experience has been like, I, I still have doubts, like even working on my comic now, it's like when I'm like, you're at that midway point, you kind of hit like occasional, like, what am I doing? Like I'm investing a lot of time into this crazy thing, you know? Right. And you're like many, many issues into the sunless circus, you know? No, I'm, so. I'm not. Like, dude, you're you're far outdone the pages. Like, I've done four issues in like six years, you know? So like, <laughs> but that's but that's okay. So like, that's that's very equivalent. Like, uh -huh. seriously, um, that's probably that's that's probably equates to about we're probably about eye to eye on like the no, amount. Sure, Josh. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. But anyway, so the point yeah. of that, mm -hmm. the point of that is like, you know, like when you're working on issue five, right. you know, you're like, like you were just telling me you're like, it's like four or six years into this thing. Mm -hmm. And there's those occasional, at least for me, um, that's definitely my experience with this thing mm -hmm. where I'm like four or so years into this thing. And mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, that's years, you know, so right. how, like I'm trying to quantify how many years I'm investing in this thing and I'll have those doubts. Yeah. But I'm like, like one of the things that is cool is like now that I've been doing it for a while, right? It's like easier to recognize, like, oh, that's just that stupid thing that happens when you're at the halfway point, right? Like that's just going to happen. And just so, from, I think from the amount of projects you do and kind of knowing yourself and 
and the kind of the process and being kind of cognizant of where your brain and your heart goes and that yeah if you're aware of it you're kind of have a more of a meta understanding of like th this is just something that happens it shouldn't stop me completely because you know that it's yes yeah. you know yeah for sure and the cool thing is too like with con like to so tie it back into conventions it's like the the um like my first experience i experienced all these things that i now i haven't conventioned as recently mm -hmm. but um I, I've never had a convention where I didn't feel like slightly nervous before, right. you know, like you get like a little, like there's a little bit of a rush, but you're kind of yeah. nervous about like, am I going to make sales? Are people right, going right. to like my work? Like that yeah. kind of stuff. Uh -huh. But the more you do, the more you have those thoughts and they just pass really quick because right. you're like, Oh yeah, that's that stupid thought I get before every convention. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> you, know? that you, you can expect it and then you can, it, it, you know that it will go away eventually and just give it time. You know? Yeah. If you just keep at it, if you don't stop doing the thing that you're doing. Exactly. And you rack up the previous convention, which shuts down that really quick because you can be like, well, last convention I had that thought right. and then I, I, you know, like it worked out really well. And yeah. so, um, to me, that's a really good thing. By the way, just for the viewers, uh, Scott is like trying to kind of re-log on so he can get his audio kind of working. So that's why that's why it's, yeah. it's me and Chris at this point. <laughs> he really hated us. He just kind of handed it. Just like screw you guys. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, so like so so my experience was that like by the last time I convention, which was a, a long a, a, quite a while ago. Mm -hmm. um, I felt the most confident I'd ever felt at a convention. And I started to get to that point where there were people who were like, I was getting return customers right? who were people yeah. who passed the last year and were oh. like, Oh dude, I wanted to pick this up last year. I'll pick it up now. Yeah. Yeah. So to me, like some of the stuff I want to um, start getting into is like, I picked up a few things in that process, but I didn't, I haven't kept at it like consistently as much as you have. Uh -huh. And I have seen gradually every year, like your presentation gets more refined. Um, you've got more kind of um, like awesome things at your booth. Like, I, um, I'm not sure, like you're still doing the fortune teller. I do, yeah, that, booth. well, let's see. There's a, the theme is still there. That, that fortune teller machine, because I used to have uh, this little wind-up box, which I, has no real purpose, just it's, that it's fun, you know? <laughs> but it's, I guess it's a, it ties into the story, right? But it's a character yeah. in the comic, and I kind of built him in a small maquette form. And, um, yeah, he, he's, he's in repair. He's in the garage still. Like, he's, <laughs> he's, he's, going, he's undergoing upgrades, because I kind of want to, before I bring him out again, I kind of want to add some some uh i don't know if it's too ambitious but i kind of want to add more lights to him you know and make his eyes glow and stuff like that but um yeah the first iteration of it was solar powered and so you can like put your hand over it and the little globe little fortune teller globe would glow but yeah i mean yeah i, I think part of that is me just wanting an excuse to m build something yeah and then also it works as a this is unique, you know, like you don't see something like that at, at a convention often, you know, like you just see the book. But if you could tie in both of those things, I think it's fun because you have an interaction with like a physical object, which is a unique experience for the, the passerby. And you can tell the story because they can actually see the character, you know. Yeah, and it gives you like, 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 yeah, and I want to clarify to you, by no means, like, cause, uh, like, Chris, I, I know you pretty well, and it's like, you're not the type of person who just do like a crass marketing thing, like, right. this is gonna draw people. Like, I, gotta, um, I gotta like it, that's the thing, like, I'm, yeah, I'm not yeah. opposed to marketing when I sincerely enjoy making it or talking about it as much as the other person does, you know, like, I could, it would kill me if I didn't enjoy what I was doing, you know, because yeah. like, and some people are good at that, they're, they're good at marketing and s selling something that necessarily their heart necessarily isn't into. Yeah. But I do like comics. I do like my own story. And yeah. For the most but, part, I like my, you know, like if I'm proud of something, you know, like I'll still like talking about it. Um, yeah. And I remember the first time you were going to make kind of like a 3D thing for your um, booth. Like you, you literally, the impetus was just that it wasn't like thinking about like even how it's going to affect people. It was just like, I wonder if I can make this really cool thing. Right. Yeah. You yeah. know, but what's cool is to see it um, because I think, and I, we get into this all the time on the show about authenticity really uh -huh. uh, c resonates with people for some right. reason. I think it makes and, sense because I think you can smell it. You know what I mean? Like there's yeah. people there 
hired to be at booths that are good at talking the game or talking, even just presenting something, which is important, yeah. you know, like having a good host or something. But like, I'm much more interested when it's the creator of that thing, even if they're not good at talking about whatever it is. If yeah. they're the ones that, if they're the one that made it, that means so much more because I'm interested in this thing and I'm looking in the eyes of someone that made this. I mean, that's an appreciation. You don't really have that type of experience anywhere else, you know? Yeah. Like, um, at, I think a, a good example, um, like it was like last week, I was at a art meetup thing mm -hmm. and I talked to another artist for like four hours. And the reason I kept in the conversation for like four hours with this person one on one, when it's like this whole social event, mm -hmm. was that they're doing a book about like NASA uh -huh. and like space flight and sciencey stuff. That's and they're cool. so passionate. Yeah. Um, like I like that kind of stuff. Right. Like as a listener, like yeah. you know, I like like Radio Lab and stuff yeah. like that. Uh -huh. But but there was something about the the um like I could have listened to that person talk about NASA and the book they're working on for for uh, two days straight probably. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. it was just they're so passionate about what they were doing mm -hmm. that it kind of resonated. And so I think that's a good like on it, taking that back to like the marketing thing. Right. I think that is actually probably the best way to do it because of the fact that we're doing comics and we're doing comics that are self-authored comics. Right. Like so if paying you to do this thing, it's not a gig, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. If it's not going to be enjoyable, don't do the convention. Right. You know? yeah. I mean, you, um, you wouldn't in, in the process of making the comic, you would know that your heart's not in it because it takes so long and you're oh, going to yeah. question why you're doing it, you know, and it's, even if it's a professional gig, it's definitely not for the money, you know? Like, it's definitely going to be because you like the story or the character. And then yeah. especially so if it's your own story, you know? But so that that kind of, I think that's what I kind of want to get into is, mm -hmm. is I think that that's part of your sales strategy and not in a crass marketing way. I think yeah. that's just kind of the way you set it up. And I think it's very effective because you set up a booth with things you wanted to make right. that you think is cool. like, like for instance, like that, that fortune teller is a great example, something yeah. you wanted to try that you think would be, you, you just thought that would be really cool. Right. Right. And then it also ties into your story. So when people come to it, you're passionate about it. It resonates that you care about it, that you're geeked out about it. You're like, right. look at this cool thing I made, you know? Yeah. You turn and, into a little kid, you know, like, you know, I yeah. think everyone does that. Like, look at this toy. Check it out. You know, like, yeah. it's infectious when somebody shows you something that they love, you know. Um, yeah, even and I think that's effective. I've seen it in action, and it's it's crazy, like, right. how, um, like, I, and I'm, I'm going to sound like I'm overselling it, but, like, as an observer, like, you are, you, you, you really work a booth in a good way, <laughs> and I don't think it, I don't think it's an effort. Yeah, like, meaning yeah. I think you are making an effort to right. make to to make sure people are having a good time. Yeah, but I don't think you're making an effort that's like a crass marketing effort. I think it's a really sincere thing, yeah. and I think there's a lot that yeah. people I, could learn from it. It spent a lot of energy for sure, but like yeah. I don't really feel it till afterwards because I'm kind of just running off the high of of enjoying being there. You know, you kind of have to rely on that type of energy because it's. It, it can be physically exhausting to do all this stuff if your goal is just to make money, you know? It really yeah. has to be driven by, I would do this regardless. You know, this is just a place to show up, to, to share this with, with other people. For sure, yeah. So, like, so why don't we get into some stuff about, like, you, you had mentioned that... Um, <laughs> What's up? Scott, Scott is back, right? You're okay? Hey, You're, Scott, you there? Uh, can, am I a robot? Am I a robot? You're better than before. Let's yeah. say, say, something, say something. Tell us. Something. <laughs> that doesn't sound too reassuring, but that was clear. Um, it's good. The audio is good. good. Yeah. 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 The okay. audio is tolerable. <laughs> audio than the video, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. We'll see if it. We'll see if it holds up. So obviously, I'm. I don't know where you guys are in the conversation, but so, so I'll just kind of hang out here till I kind of get an idea where we're at. And then sure. yeah. Continue to talk good. about Chinaman. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll recap a little bit too, because I feel like, I mean, I, I have this tendency to direct things and tangents and Scott, you're my anchor. So, <laughs> um, but, uh, um, so what we, what we've been kind of gearing towards is the idea that, um, I was just kind of trying to describe to people like, well, I mean, actually that would be a good way to start is like maybe having Chris kind of describe his booth. Um, 
And then there are certain choices that you should make when you're setting up your booth that I think, Chris, you do really well. Like you, you, you have um, different levels of kind of viewership. Like you, you right. have stuff that's front faced. You have stuff that's flat on the table. Yeah. Uh, you have a really kind of cool way of displaying prints. Um, and I'm not sure if you do this. You still do some of the techniques with the selling of the print like that. Oh, yeah. um, but I thought that might be kind of cool because I think it's like, once again, it, I think all of this is going to tie back into the fact that it all ties into things you think would be fun. Right. It, it to should do. be like, like just because you, you know, somebody else did it, if it only works if it works for your product, you know? Yeah. 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 Like if like, for instance, the print thing you're doing would not work with me or my personality at mm -hmm. all at a convention, <laughs> but it, but it's so authentic. The yeah. way you do it, it doesn't come across like it. Well, the thing I think it uh, helps that I can tie it into the story because it takes place in a circus. Yeah, and I could be a circus huckster, and it still makes sense. You know, <laughs> like it's it's all tied in with like I could be a carnival bar. You, you know, like I don't go I don't go that far, but the little little gimmicky things that I have kind of tie into that aesthetic of of trying to get attention through things that you can hold or interact with. Um, or like trying to create a curiosity show, which I'm really, I really do like. You know, I, I'm a big fan of that aesthetic of kind of turn of the century um, Victorian things, or even uh, mid-century. You know, like 1930s and 40s. If you've ever seen like uh, the HBO show Carnival, like I, that aesthetic is totally what I'm always trying to go for, um, mixed in with with um, kind of technology and my own spin using robots and things like that. But um, yeah, I, I try to add things that you usually wouldn't find on a comic book convention table. So like my wife and I are always looking at display things because basically when you're, you're given a table, you have the ability to kind of art correct that space to be whatever you want it to be. And it's basically like curating your own gallery, you know, just for that, just for that time. And I think like, I like maximizing that as much as possible by adding in using materials that are, co are consistent with the aesthetic and the topic of my comics and kind of making that interesting. So there's a lot of wood, a lot of leather and fabric, you know, and I think like kind of using that cohesively is my, my goal. Um, you know, so that, that does tie into something else. So like it, it does all reflect your comic, the sunless circus. So why don't like, I, I should have probably asked about that oh, at the yeah. beginning, but I mean like, why don't you let um, like, you know, the people watching and stuff like know what the Sunless Circus is about and, yeah. and just a rough idea and then and kind of describe then like how your booth kind of reflects that because you're right, it is, um, thinking about it, it is it very cohesive and then maybe it might actually be good to kind of maybe get into like both booths because you also do like the kit and rivet stuff. Right, yeah. And so yeah. that would be cool to kind of hear how you approach both because both have a really clear theme Right and uh, a cool theme and and themes that you're really into, mm -hmm. and and they're both kind of like almost like two different approaches, um, based on what what you're what you're trying to kind of present at the right. booth. So, what what's the Sunless Circus about, and then how do you have your booth kind of to reflect that? Yeah. So the the one line pitch, right, the elevator pitch for <laughs> the Sunless Circus. It's a story about a robot acrobat boy, and he dreams of running away from the circus to become an accountant. And that's, that's kind of where it all started is that, that it was a short eight page wordless story. It was like a Charlie Chaplin. There's no, no text um, story. And I kind of told the story backwards. And it's kind of built in this universe of old timey circus, but there's a robot in there. And so you're kind of dealt with, with the mystery of how did you get there? Um, and the other people that are in the circus and, and yeah, they basically kind of expands that out that way. So it's, um, yeah, it's a mix of old uh, vintage meets technology, without really an explanation. It's almost like I think of it in my head. The world is kind of like a like an alternate history. Like, what if one thing was different, and you have a little bit of Jules Verne, a little bit of uh, steampunk, and I think it's been defined as steampunk before I even knew what it was. But I think like that's a that's a close uh, close category that it tends to fit for people that aren't familiar with the stuff that I've done. Nice. Um, yeah, and you guys. Should also check out those comics and stuff. Um, they're really good. They're really well written. They're like um, the kind of comics I love to like buy, at, at, even if it weren't done by a friend. Because it's <laughs> like, like I was saying, it's authentic and it's it's uh, something that 
it, it's it's just really well executed and it's it's clever it's smart nice. it's smart writing so um but uh so then like your boost kind of got this like curio mm -hmm. i i do it is funny i hesitate to stay say steampunk because i know you started it kind of before the whole <laughs> steam steampunk thing, might have, i'm pretty sure it existed i just didn't yeah. know there was a word for it you know so yeah it's, uh, I, yeah yeah, I don't know if it had just blown up to the extent that that it, mm -hmm. to where it was like this just commonly known thing. Like a new genre, yeah, yeah. But um, but it does have that aesthetic. It does have kind of like a, a like old world technology mixed with, you know, yeah, like a what if. Uh -huh. Um, and and there is a feel to your booth. So like your booth kind of has, um, so so. What are like what, what, when you're approaching the setup of that booth when you're laying it out? Like, what are you considering? Um, well, you know, for the viewer, like, what do you want somebody's experience to be like when they walk up to your booth? Yeah, I think at this point, like I mentioned, how we started with just three prints originally, and I have a lot of prints now. So it it just at this point, I'm kind of having to deal with being a good curator because there's a lot to see at this point, and. And I think I'm trying. To, I'm always kind of at this point struggling with like how to show all that without it being overwhelming. <laughs> so I think I've I've converted what used to be kind of just showcasing a few pieces to kind of making it like a record store. You know, where you have to kind of look and hunt to find something that you like. So the experience is kind of invite in people with one image that that kind of represents one aspect of the type of things that I do, and then invite people in to kind of browse and see if there's something that they like. Because I think you kind of, it, it's kind of like looking, going to like an antique store, you know? And yeah. you don't know what you're exactly what you're looking for, but it's always kind of fun to, because you're never known. It's kind of that treasure hunt. Of, there might be something in here. And so I have an assortment of big prints, small ones, um, different things like pins and buttons and um, t-shirts on occasion too. But I think like having an assortment of a variety of things that people can choose from helps. Um, not just for taste, but because there's going to be people that really love your work, are willing to spend 50 bucks on this one thing, or there's people that like just like your work, but you know they might not have the funds at the time, but they still like it, and they could just still get a pin, you know. And I yeah. think, as I think about that, like there's people that I like, but they might not have a diversity of items that kind of cater to their wallet, you know? Yeah. <laughs> have yeah. Something like, here's this. It's not the same thing. It's not the big ticket item, but if you still like my stuff, it has my website on it, you can still follow more things and discover things later. And oftentimes that's a way to kind of, you know, start a relationship with people that that next time they're there, they might they might have saved up and maybe they really love that thing. And yeah. they, they, you know, you know, it's just um, you know, pull the trigger on something that might be a bigger ticket item. But having a diversity of items that I think or a range of prices, I think is good. It's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. You brought up two really good things, like the um, well, you brought up more than two, but yeah. but there's two that I think are really worth highlighting. Like one is um, the diversity of prices, like you were saying, like mm -hmm. um, and and the that also ties into like something I think we've talked about. Scott's definitely mentioned at the show, which is like, you know, a lot of people when they have their first convention experience. Um, and I've convention next to people who kind of have attitude about somebody like picking up their book and being like, yeah, yeah, I'm really interested and I might come back and buy this, you know, and they're like, yeah, they might come back and like they have kind of an attitude about it after the customer leaves, you know, right. or like the, you know, the person checking out your booth leaves. And it's kind of like um, almost everyone I know who's, who's done conventions, it's like you never want to assume that person actually doesn't mean it. Right. Because who knows? maybe they really did like it and they had 20 bucks to spend and then they walked past the graphic novel that they went there to buy. Right. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, I'm going to get this this time. Next year, I'll go back and get that thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah, um, I, I try to, you know, like, it's sometimes an excuse, sometimes it's not. I totally had people come back at the end of the convention and yeah. still ask, do you have that one thing? And then... For sure. It's great, because, like, they meant it, you know? Like, that's nice. Yeah. It totally happens. You never want to write off somebody just because they say that. Yeah, um, for sure. Like, you have and, to at least try to believe them, you know? That, <laughs> totally. Yeah. Like, almost every show where, you know, at the end, all these people come rushing back, like, they, like oh, I, yeah, I meant to get back, but I couldn't find it and all this stuff. Right. And, yeah, yeah. And then and you've got this little boost of sales at the end of the day, which is, which yeah. is cool, because so, a lot of, sometimes they do come back, so. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you have to think of it like a customer too, though. If you're, there's so much to see, and especially if you're like just a fan, 
it's kind of hard to choose. Like you, you have limits as to how much you can buy. So yeah. you're, you're, you want to look at everything first before jumping the gun and getting something that, and just basically, you know, spending your wallet on something that there could be nothing left. So if you think of like a, as a person who's kind of exposed to so much things that are potentially awesome gifts or for themselves, like you want to give them at least that time to kind of think about it. Cause I do like, I totally browse, you know, yeah. I never, I rarely, yeah. I, I super think about like things that I'm, I'm, I make a conscious decision about buying stuff. So yeah, that happens for sure. Yeah. And that's, that's a good point about like kind of empathizing with the person that's mm -hmm. there too, because like you, you, it's important when you're boothing at a convention to not forget what it's like to walk around a convention mm -hmm. as a fan, because like I, I, I've never had, like even once I've boosted that, I've never had an experience where I didn't like leave a, a comic convention and go, oh, I should have bought that thing. Like mm -hmm. I there, and sincerely, if I was back the next year, would pick it up. Right. You know, and told the person that same thing. <laughs> like yeah. you know, and tried really hard to not you know do it in a way where they might feel like disappointed or something. Like just mm -hmm. sincerely, like this is really rad. I'll try to be back. You know. Um, but but you can't forget kind of I, like I guess what you what we're all kind of getting at is like it's important not to forget what it's like to be that person because you know it is overwhelming and 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 like we're not the only um, fish in the pond you know as artists and honestly like that's half the fun of conventioning too right. is like you get to kind of be exposed to all these awesome artists mm -hmm. you know yeah. Um, so, so I thought that was cool. And then you, you were also talking, so, so the variety of price point thing I think is important too, because I have totally had that experience as a consumer mm -hmm. going to a convention and really wanting to support an artist. And they literally, the only thing they have, the tier they have is like a $20 book. Right. Yeah. And, and having a moment of like looking at my pocket and being like, I could give them five, but I can't do 20. Right. I just yeah. Can't. yeah. And, um, and I have that struggle all the time, just being online. I mean, uh -huh. like, there's so many Kickstarters I want to fund and yeah. support, and right. it's like we're all limited in our budget. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's a good thing to remember too when you're setting it up. And it's you know like having the different tiers. Mm -hmm. And there, there was one other thing you touched on that I that's a concern of mine, and I'm kind of curious what you your guys' thoughts on it are. But yeah. as I'm thinking about approaching it again, that'll probably be in about a year. Yeah, um, I get worried about. Uh, like having too many options and yeah, being kind of like uh -huh. being like the the restaurant with like too much food and then it takes somebody 50 hours to figure out what food to order and by the time they figure it out they're on to the next booth you know yeah, right, that's right. what I worry about I yeah, don't know. that's, that's uh, where I'm at right now there's definitely too, too many things on the menu and I yeah. I yeah I have to think I think I almost need like outside help you know to like help me decide because um, I get attached to stuff. I, you know, like I, I kind of, what drove me to make the thing is the same thing that makes me still like it, you know? So like, um, there's a little bit of nostalgia sometimes with like, oh, I like making this piece, you know? Or there's one person that still likes this one thing. I, I would think about retiring something that's like, oh, this is awesome. This is my favorite. I'm like, well, I guess I should still sell it. Cause <laughs> you know, like when you see somebody enjoy something, um, yeah. but definitely when it comes to branding, it's tough because if you have too much, then it is definitely easy. It definitely is easy for people to get overwhelmed with selection. Yeah, that's. Yeah. That, I was going to say that's like one of the biggest things that I'm going to change this year going into going back to Phoenix Comic Con because in the past I don't know if anyone's from it's pretty elaborate, mm -hmm. and I mean it's it's basically like in the underground layer in the beginning of my video a lot of that kind of stuff with all these tubes and pipes and. That's you know, cool. It's just, yeah. it's very, it's cool, but it's just sensory overload. There's just so much stuff to see. <laughs> action. Yeah, people don't know what to make of it, and it's just like, whoa, this is just too much. Uh -huh. And so, as much as I like that stuff, I think what I'm going to do is uh, just, if nothing else, is an experiment just to see what the difference is. I'm just going to go basically because I mean, literally, my tabletop uh -huh. belt. And I'm, it's this massive setup, so I'm gonna go. I'm just gonna go basically all back and just let just the product be the focus. Yeah. And see if that makes. And it's hard for to to do that, make that decision because I and I get it, really get it. 
and I've had people like, oh, this is like one of the best booths I've ever seen. Uh -huh. But just, you know, that and the fact that I don't, don't know what to make of it. Like, I don't know who these characters are. I'm, uh -huh. I'm confused. I, it doesn't relate in my brain. I need I need something I'm familiar with. So right. Um, I wonder if like it, it almost but, might help take a, have like a, a survey or something, you know, to see what proportion of people think it's wicked awesome, or people that are confused, you know, like I don't know how how. Yeah, if you could stop that. people and say, oh, take the survey. What was your? Experience? <laughs> was this too much for you? Or? How was your convention experience oh. <laughs> at my booth? Yeah. I'm gonna try. <laughs> things differently and just because I just you know because I do all right I, I always I, I always profit but I know crazy people and some of that just because I'm not selling things that people are familiar with mm -hmm. but um, but one of the things you just noticing just boothing next to other people Jeremy and Burley we booth next to each other and, and um, him on the show and he kind of talked about some of his techniques and stuff but he had he was really good at just inviting people in and, and and he had he didn't have like all those prints like on a print wall behind him or anything but mm -hmm. he had like the portfolio right and so i'm thinking for me why not do both because i think different people like to look at artwork different ways there are some people that get a glance and there's some people like the flip through thing so right. even though it'll be the same prints mm -hmm. i'm going to do both i'm going to have I'm gonna have a book out there so people are right up and close with me. Because right. a lot of times when they're, you know, they're looking at the wall and they're pointing at things, you don't know exactly what they're pointing at or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the book's right there. You kind of walk through it and explain what the things are, and yeah. you still have that those the prints on the wall for people to check out. So I'm gonna try that out. I'm just gonna try a lot of see just what what works. Yeah, because fortunately, yeah. yeah, fortunately I've got I've got actually. You know, invited as a guest, so I've got my table paid for me. So I have a lot of room to kind of, you know, I've got a lot of leeway as far as sales. So if, if awesome. it doesn't work, then you know, so I'll have to see. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's a good place to be because it's it's definitely tough when you have like a huge table fee or travel costs that you're kind of worried about. You know, like when, when yeah. you're <laughs> yeah about, worried about at least just making it back. You know, because it's a uh, um, it it's one of those things that you want to try to experiment, but it, it, if if making money is the focus, it makes it really difficult and a risk, you know. Yeah. But definitely, I think you you and I are probably in a similar spot where having to make decisions about that type of thing. I'd love to hear how. Yeah, it goes. And so that was just from what you're describing, because I sell all kinds of different things, and mm -hmm. there's certain things like one of the things that I really I I love, but I just have to I have to stop is. Um, so I, I had these because my whole thing is like a, it's basically a mad science supply store. So yeah. if you were uh, if you were a mad scientist, this is where you would go to get your supplies. Whether you want to decorate your underground lair with prints, uh -huh. I mean, I've got bow ties that are sort of science themes. So if you want to look good while taking over the world, uh -huh. or and then I've got these little science experiments. You know, they're just little novelties. Yeah. Um, so I've got these novelties, and each one of them I correlated with a different print. Like I've got these brains. If you add water, they'll grow. And mm -hmm. I, it's basically just it's basically just cheap stuff that I can you get online from you know wherever Alibaba or something. But I repack it cool, right. um, and I write a whole story along. Everything has a story about what it is and everything like that. So mm -hmm. I made these little prints like Attack of the Fifty Foot Brain, and mm -hmm. it goes with this print. But it was just so hard for me to say, oh, this this print and it comes in this gift box and all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. So now what I'm going to do is I'm not even going to mention the print. Uh, they're Because people look at the, go, oh, this is cool. I want this. And okay, you buy that. And not, then after they make the purchase, I'll just throw the print in. I'm not even going to, because anything you have to explain is difficult. Right. People have to look at something and say, this is cool. I want this. And if you have to go too much into it, it, it it's just hard it's hard. You know? Yeah, I think then, then again, it's like a commercial. It's like within fifteen to thirty seconds, I think, is the max that somebody right, can listen right. before they kind of start tuning out. There are some things yeah. though that, like that, that Chris, you've done on like that are kind of interactive and require a, a slight explanation. But I've noticed people are super <laughs> engaged because, um, so like, like there's there's a couple that that I wanted to just kind of touch on because I I just want to kind of 
get into like the some of the kind of outside of the box stuff you've done mm. that I think really makes your your booth unique. And like I said, it's very specific to Sunless Circus and the U. I don't think like everybody watching should do the same technique. But um, but it, like I so there's mind. the scratchers. Like, yeah, I think you want to know it, about. Like, it can't rely. I, it can't rely completely on the gimmick. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, because people, I, I've had people even ask me, like, can I use this? And like, yeah, it's just an idea. It's yeah. not like I painted it, patented. Yeah. But, um, like one of the most recent, I, I guess it's kind of getting old now. I kind of need to come up with something new. But one of my things is that since it's a circus, there's also like fortune telling machines, a la like, uh, what is it, big, you know, like those make a wish machines. And that's one of the characters in the, in the story. And so basically, like, I made little printout cards. Let me see if I actually have any here. But um, basically, you you can scratch off. You know how you have like silver silver stickers on top of like um, like those instant win prizes. It's one of those things, but you put it on a card. So when you scratch it, it's kind of placed so it's her crystal ball. And there's about thirty oh, cool. something different fortunes that you get. And so you basically. If you buy a comic, you get a free fortune teller card. You scratch it, and then it, it tells you your silly. I came up with a bunch of really like dad joke fortunes on it, you know. <laughs> and then, and I think like one out of however many, like you have a chance to win a free comic. So you can either get a free one if you with any purchase, or you buy a buy a, a card for a dollar, and you have a chance to like either be, you know, told a joke or win a free comic. So it's kind of like a like a lottery ticket, but. <laughs> Kind of branded with characters that are in the story, um, that that kind of tie in together. That's that awesome. sounds really cool. That's I mean, this is like I think you and I are way way. On the yeah, same no, way. totally. Yeah, you're, you're, you're that's science. totally the same kind of thing I would do yeah. if I had kind of your theme. Uh -huh. And it's funny because I did a video a while back where I was I was just trying to because I like I said I got I was I was basically in the video I was saying well kind of come up with your own idea and one of the things I said was you know if you if you like because it's not even knowing kind of what yours and yours kind of goes a little further than that. But but I even mentioned like you could maybe even be a little bit of a carnival barker because it kind of goes with the theme if you do it right. I said that was probably the only scenario where you're kind of a carnival. But, but yeah, I mean it's just that that's it sounds really cool. Do you have do you have pictures online of your booth well, setup I can, and stuff? Yeah, right? I think if you actually go to the the link in the. The little my little name tag thing, the sunlesscircus.com. That goes to a part of my website that just focuses just on my comics. And nice. okay, the only way cool. I, I basically recorded myself in a video. Um, actually, no, that's something else. <laughs> Sorry, um, but you can you can see a picture of it. Actually, it's uh, I found a little box that I have my little cigar box. So it's like it's like this. People can see awesome. this fortune awaits, and this little silver sticker. Awesome. These are kind of Technically handmade because I get these I get these cards printed and there's like a bunch of different uh -huh. varieties but I have to like peel these stickers and put them on each by hand. <laughs> oh, that's oh. totally something. I mean, I got oh, no. I have these mix and match trading cards. Yeah, and I have to do it so it would work. Right. Right. Is to actually just print them up full and then cut them myself. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I've got all these like, cards and. Right. It's yeah. not. Def it's definitely not made to to be a. You know, like a money maker because it takes yeah. a lot of time to, because I'll give them away too. You know, just even if people don't know that it comes with something, like yeah, I was like, this is kind of fun. You seem interested. Just take one. You know, but um, yeah, I don't think they understand how much time it takes. Is because I, I get into it myself because I enjoy making it. You know? <laughs> and I know I know you do, yeah. Scott. Dude, I have this. Actually, reminds me, I have one of your your original uh, Young and the Dead comics when we did the mini comics dump. Yeah, I, I've got yeah. I is that the, the sort of circus theme to it? Yeah, that no, that, that, I think the yeah. one I did was the first half of that comic, and I just basically, mm -hmm. you know, like, just took it to Kinko's and, and made some of those. Yeah, and then, and ex you did, you did the little die cut keyhole. Yes, but dude, <laughs> yeah. mine was. That was probably an exact knife, like, right, like right. I did with mine. Yeah, dude, yeah. mine was nothing compared to the, the fact that I have it. I saved it because I, I realized how handmade this was because. Okay. On the zombie hands, I could tell that you you like used an exacto knife to cut out all the fingers of the right. zombies. Well, it was so I'm gonna much get a cricket that. machine or something and do yeah, it. Yeah, I could. I could not believe on, that. But... Yeah, I couldn't believe you put in that much work for it, just a free for fun, you know, like tradesies things, you know. Yeah. yeah. 
that definitely that was really awesome. Well, I, and I sell those things too. I'm out of stock on them, but yeah. But get it. Some people don't. I mean, it's like, why is this one that's way smaller costs like five times as much as the right. regular one? Yeah. You know, but some people, some people appreciate that. So, yeah, I think I it's, it's <laughs> mostly people that have tried it themselves that appreciate yeah. the work yeah. that do it. But I definitely noticed. You know, it was. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's like it's more than a screen print. This is yeah. like, definitely like a hand cut. It's it's like buying a little what do you call those little silhouette portraits, you know, where you have to cut it up. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. that's 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 kind of awesome though, and that's a good reminder for anybody who's like attending conventions too, because like a lot of the time, I think people might have the perception walking up to like a comic booth, mm -hmm. um, like even other cartoonists might be like, oh, that guy's just loaded. And so you can pay somebody to do these like scratch off things, and it's like no, they actually they found a way right. to make it look super professional, but it's mm -hmm. like it's it's very hand done and meticulous, and um, and I think that kind of stuff becomes more apparent too. Like all of all three of us have been doing illustration and design for a long time, so you start realizing like how much stuff is handmade. Yeah, and it's like a it's I remember like I must have been like. Eight years ago or something, I had this like moment of just my brain just kind of exploding because I realized everything is pretty much handmade. Like Wait, you, you, know, you, you got a comic about that, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's totally true. Yeah, yeah, and it was an auto bio like t shirt design thing, but yeah. it's like the but the but the the gist of it was like sincere. It's like it really is amazing when you start like getting into getting books produced or anything like that, and you see what the actual machinery is doing, even at like a big facility, and there's still so much that's still hand done. Right. So take that to a micro level, like none of us are corporations. Right. So like when you walk up to a booth of like, especially a cartoonist, you know, oh. um, a lot of that stuff that like, you know, is, is like an acquired thing over years and years of conventioning where it's right. like, you know, you've figured out these these cool things, but I also think it's cool that you guys really want people to have a good experience at your booth. And like, I think the fact that you're saying you, you'll just give them the card, yeah. it's like you want them to have a fun time and a good memory like associated with coming up to your booth. And I think right. that's really, um, I, I don't know, I think that's at the base of what you guys think. I wanted to touch on some stuff that was said in the chat. Oh, so, we have a chat. Um, we have a chat. <laughs> So there's a so um, I'd rather be drawing says Carnival was awesome sounds like a rad book, and then they were asking me what I'd want to have at, at my booth um, when I do get to the convention once I start conventioning again. So um, and they, they're like asking like what other merchandise because I I was talking about targeting the book mm -hmm. and I think Chris and I have both talked about this. I don't know, um, like I'm still not sure where I fall on it. But but my my gut wants me to uh, like my my vision for it is that I probably am not going to have like like the Monty Python print I did recently or anything like that would sell pretty well at a convention I think but mm -hmm. I'm not going to really I don't want anything distracting from the book okay but I'm not an idiot so oh. like meaning like I I don't want to put somebody in that uncomfortable position of being like I want to support this artist I only have five bucks and it's mm -hmm. a twenty dollar or fifteen dollar item you know right. so I, I'm gonna have prints I'm gonna have um, probably postcards possibly lapel pins yeah um, you know there, there's just all 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 sorts of items in different price points right not too many because mm -hmm. like it I don't want it to be um, overwhelming and I'm also thinking about even downsizing the booth space uh -huh. um, so maybe even doing just like a half booth or something a half table maybe just a full table but not not a massive amount so like a lot of real estate can be dedicated to a few but variety of items right and then having it all tight like it literally will all be four quarterly stories hey, that's, so that's really the cool. yeah I think like that's uh, the jump that's scary though because Chris yeah. like you were pointing out like I'm I'm not a wealthy like no none of us are like loaded so it's you know it costs money to get to the convention it costs money to stay at a hotel it or costs money to get off table what's yeah. up or even you know cost to make the stuff if you're gonna break yeah it and, yeah the yeah. investment in the stuff you know you want to at least break even on on your cost to print right, right, right. Um, yeah and so, like the the prospect of doing it is a little risky and scary, but but like you know, 
I, I've mentioned this on the podcast before. Or I call it a podcast sometimes, but I, but I have it. But I've mentioned that on the show before that um, that that like the, there's a it's like it's kind of a risk, but at the same time, all the guys that I know that I associate with a property, like a right. book, yeah. like th their booths are all about that book. Yeah. And then maybe they add more books, but it's all about that book. And then they get known as like, Hey, that's too much coffee, man. You know? Right. right. And it's like, to me, like, I, I kind of want to get there where it's like, but, but at the same time, while I say that, I, I don't know if the reality of that works out. I'll have to kind of see. Um, I think, I think it's cool because I, I know Scott's interested in kind of starting to push the book more. I know you're interested in pushing the book, Chris. So I like I'm, more of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I think even the fact that you were doing that scratch off to, to give people the book, you know, right. to find a way to kind of, because whatever price point they're spending, you know, probably on like a print would probably cover the book, you know, mm -hmm. so it's not a total loss for you. <laughs> right. right. Um, but it's like, but it's a way to get it into people's hands because that's the whole point. Like, just to get people to read this thing, uh -huh. <laughs> you know. Hey Josh. Yeah. I was gonna. You you probably already thought about this, but in, just in case you haven't, because you mentioned that you were gonna sell prints and things, but you want to focus more on the book. But I know sections in your story kind of have these graphs or these charts or thing, things that I think would, you know maybe they might be tweaked or kind of reformatted, but I think a lot of those would make really good prints. Like the, you know, I know you did sort of the airplane chart thing, like basically this is depression, these symptoms or whatever, or whatever different things like that. I think that would work work really well. Plus your, I plus I think like the, the design that you did, like shut up and make stuff, even though it's not technically, you know, it's still very much that same style. Right. Yeah, and that's the part I'm not sure about. Like, because I like, like the thing I will say that you guys do way more well than I ever did at conventions. Because my experience convention was just everything in the kitchen sink. You know, I'd I'd have a banner, and and I'd try to make the display okay, but I'd be like, do you want a, a print of you know Kermit the Frog X-ray, or do you want like this auto bio thing? that's like really personal like it's all over the place and you can have anything or a skateboard you know like and and i didn't um i didn't think about like a theme or a look and and i have to say like like knowing what both of your booths look like um can be, do you guys post like pictures of your booths on on instagram um i, I got some I yeah, I realized you that. Big yeah. yeah, so why don't you guys like throw out your Instagram handles just so if you, if people are watching, they can actually check out these booths because they're really cool, it's, you know? Um, yeah, Scott, you your description of your booth makes it sound really interesting, Scott. I kind of have never seen it, so I want to see. <laughs> it's yeah, I mean, crazy. it'll be a lot different. And if you go back, so, so I eventually did go back to Artist Alley because I realized that I could, if I got two Artist Alley tables, uh -huh. A lot less, and I almost have about the same space as I do with a booth. Uh -huh. And because I'm because I am selling my own original stuff, I can I can get an artist alley table. And it's not like you know some people that if they're selling like you know toys or something that they purchase yeah. themselves, they can't really do that. Uh -huh. But um, so yeah, so I kind of moved back. So um, but if you go to my Instagram, maybe you'd have to kind of scroll back through the history. I'm sure there's some of the booth, and the booth was pretty cool and massive, and then. Then I kind of went back to the kind of the um, the artist alley, but I got two tables, um, which I'm going to do again this year. But like I said, um, it's going to look a lot different, so uh -huh. I don't know. We'll have to see. Yeah, we'll have to see, I know? think that's kind of mine too. Like I've got a bunch of new, like I bought an old vintage trunk, so I'm going to take that this year. So I'm, mm -hmm. I've never used it before, but I'm constantly adding and taking away stuff. Like uh, yeah, because I, I had, one of the things I yeah. had. Still may bring because it's also it makes a good carrying case and it's a I'm able to put all my stuff in it and lock it kind of like this truck you're talking about. You can at the end of the day, you know, how people put the sheets over their stuff. Right, right. I I basically built what is what looks like from Back to the Future, That's and so I use cool. prop stuff up on. But at yeah, the end yeah. of the day, I can take all my table stuff, open it up, put it all in there, and lock it. Nice. So, That's cool. um, but that, but and but the, the problem with that is you get a lot of people that are like, oh, are you selling that? Or it's like, mm -hmm. oh, that's better. And it was definitely inspired. 
but it's got my branding on it and everything. And it's a plutonium case, which isn't really, you know, it's it's, it's not yeah. like yeah, it's the you know, Pact of the Future doesn't own a plutonium case. Actually, you know, you know, yeah, it's your yeah. own interpretation of it, you know. Right. So, but I still might do that. But there's a bunch of other stuff that I had on the table that was just oh, that's yeah, cool. was, yeah. He has like a. Stuff. He has a massive, like, fabricated sign. Yeah, like, this is it's awesome. It's beautiful. It's rad. I like the, it's really I like the cool pipes setup. and stuff. Yeah, that's really neat. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you guys, um, if you guys are watching, check out the boost. And then, um, so Scott, you're just Circworks on Instagram, yeah. right? And then, yeah. uh, Chris, what's do um, you on public Instagram? I think you are. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's Sketch Point Zero One. Got yeah. it. Okay, so like, yeah, so like, um, post a pic on your Instagram, like from WanderCon. I'm sure you will, but um, you guys should check out his booth and check it. Actually, you you know, if you're in LA, check out WanderCon and check it out. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, like the thing I like about both of your booths is there's a theme, and so like while there's a lot of products, it's like it does tie around a theme and a look, and so I I do think both of you are really strong at branding with that, and that's something I'm gonna try to kind of. Keep in mind because that's another way of kind of unifying things around the comic is maybe I can, maybe I don't have to pare down to just the comic, but just things that fit the look of the comic, mm -hmm. you know. Um, well, the, the nice thing is it's a story about auto bio, so you, you can't fail. Yeah, <laughs> the fact that's that you're true. there is it kind of ties in with with the aesthetic. It's like, oh, you look like that guy that's in the book. Yeah, that makes me nervous though. Like that's an interesting thing because I I. It, it, even in the past, like most of what I'd sell, I can like I'd sell some books, but I'd mostly push like prints and stuff like that, and that's how I'd make my booth, you know. Right. Yeah. Um, and whenever I would sell a comic, it was always uncomfortable because people are flipping through and it's auto bias. So you're like, yeah. you want to be like, I'm not there anymore. Like that's <laughs> not who I am now, you know. Um, I think if they're a sophisticated reader, they know yeah. that. You know that that kind of you know. It, Art is kind of informed by reality, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's exactly that, you know. Oh, for sure, yeah. But it'll be interesting, like, because this one's really confessional, so it's going to be right. really interesting, yeah, like, selling it and yeah. not trying to make people like making sure people feel comfortable and not right. awkward looking at it and then looking up, like, yeah. <laughs> I, <don't. laughs> like, I think it's the people that really sit down with it are the are the people that you want to reach, you know, that yeah. are willing to invest their time in, in, into a longer book. It's not a floppy twenty-two page action story, you know, like it's really a rumination on these important topics that take some time to digest. Yeah. And the people that really appreciate it are the people that are gonna buy it and then come back to you to really, you know, like if it, it really give their thoughts after they've really thought about it, not just a you can't really get a feel for it by thumbing through it, you know. You can appreciate maybe the aesthetic, you know, yeah. the art style, but the story takes, especially when it's a longer book, I think it's kind of understood that you're going to want to buy this and take it home first, you know. Yeah, I just, like, one of the things that's crossed my mind is, like, would Jeff Smith have gotten to where Jeff Smith did with his own property mm -hmm. had he had, like, a booth with, like, bone and bone prints and then, like, also, like, prints related to pop culture and stuff like that like or would he have just been like jeff smith uh -huh. who like does this comic but he also does this other stuff right because like i remember like when he was still doing cartoon books you'd go to a convention and it would be prince of bone it's all bone like that's yeah. it it was that yeah. was his property and it's I, it's just something that mulls in my head a lot um I, I do want to also get into what Set, Setra, um, her, her, her comment earlier in the chat, she wanted us, she's not in the chats right now, but she wanted us to address um, whether it's good to focus on original stuff and the slow and, the slow and steady route. Um, and I don't know if that ties in. Is, do you think that, that, Scott, how do you interpret that, like that question? Yeah, I think it's just, I think it's basically in there because, it is difficult and it's very, it's, it's discouraging. Cause like, I mean, I, I watch a lot of like, I don't, you guys watch Will Terry's videos. Mm -hmm. You're, Will you're Terry. robotting a bit. Will Terry. Uh, okay, got it. I don't know. I don't know the name. Yeah. I don't okay. know the name. Uh -huh. Well, he does like this really cute version of fan art and everything. And, um, and he, he, he talks about his convention experiences and he basically lays everything out. Are you guys hearing? Yes. Yeah, uh -huh. I can hear you. Okay. 
tells you his numbers, what he's making and stuff. And he's making a killing at these shows. And then I'm like, I'm like, man, you know, maybe I should just sell fan art. <laughs> but then, you know, you know, but I don't know. I, I, maybe I just do things the hard way. I want to just do I mean, just when you when you do kind of go that route where you're just selling, it, it's difficult and it's, it's taking a killing because it's. I mean, if you've got that, everyone, uh, the people doing fan art have that built-in audience. People already know which you don't have to do right. like that. So yeah, um, so it's so, it's difficult when you're doing your own stuff. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of some of that cut out. So I'm, I think we're gonna just do robot interpreter. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. You go, um, Josh. I, so, I kind of got okay. most of it. I so, think. Uh, so what I from what I gather, it's like the gist of what Scott is saying, and and it's easy to reiterate because I agree with all of it. It's um it's that like I think all of us price side on the tend to lean on the side of like original work, um but at the same time, it you know it's hard to kind of. It's it's kind of like taking a hit if if like basically at a convention if I have a Wolverine drawing, mm -hmm. um, it you know instantly I'm relating to way more fans because it's a property that's already got a built-in fan base, and by even selling it, like I'm aligning myself with that property, right. so that person's gonna have more. Like if they're a big Wolverine fan, they're gonna come up to my booth and be like, "Dude, I love Wolverine. That's cool. We have you already have a commonality, which is great." Mm -hmm. for making a connection and also great for sales like because you could you know potentially push more like sell more and maybe some some original stuff mm -hmm. um and so there's different techniques i think we all would take with that but i think all of us like want to kind of like the focus of the convention that we'd like people to get is like it's like chris was saying like you know somebody is investing in a print and and it's they're throwing down you know fifteen twenty dollars for a print and um and i'm just speculating that i don't know what, what, what <laughs> no. chris what you're charging for that that's but, pretty close yeah yeah but the point being like you know that's they're throwing down like and and meanwhile like there's a comic and it's three bucks and they're right. like yeah i'll go with the print and you're like oh here's the free comic no no i don't need it you know and you're like oh, but it's yeah yeah you, uh -huh. you know what i mean i don't think that's happened because they're, they're, <laughs> they're beautiful i think comics. i tend I don't think I tend to offer things until I see a vested interest. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. But the because but the, you know how much work it took. You know that that three dollar comic cost like two dollars and fifty cents to print. You know that's the thing. So it's yeah. a bigger loss for you. It's a better deal for them because like the investment was probably more, more to print the book than it was to print the print. Right. But the but the thing is like it it's this juggling act and and it's I think it's something that like um, Cetria like you would have to kind of think about and kind of mull over for yourself and each individual artist kind of has to mull over for themselves where where they want to land on that spectrum because it's all over the place like i i've done pop culture related stuff um and shown it at conventions and sold and sold it at conventions and that has been a, like a, exactly like i described like a nice in that's made sales for the thing i want to sell which is my comics right um and i've had it work the total opposite where and and like where I'm starting to lean is I've, I've realized I feel and this is all theory right now, but I, I've realized like I think that my convention experiences were leaving people with the impression of that was a cool illustrator. I got a great print of the thing I like that was made by and it, somebody else's name. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but but it's hard to say because like you know I think like in the sense of. Um, like Chris, like your booth, you have like Darth Vader prints, but they're like licensed prints, mm -hmm. and you should be able to sell them because <laughs> you have the license. You know, it, like they're they're legitimately licensed art, and so you know, like you can sell them in confidence and not worry that like Marvel's going to walk by and be like, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and at the same time, um, they're they're very much in your style, so it's like it's almost like I would almost think of it like a cover song. It's like. Um, right. Yeah, my, I think that's, my a really good, that's a yeah. really good analogy. I think like people can get known for a cover, but is yeah. that what you really want to be known forever for? You know, like I think I like when I do things that are Star Wars or Marvel because I like it. Since, yeah. But I don't want to be known as just this person who draw this character that I didn't create. You yeah. Know, I think I'd rather much be known for even if it's a tiny comic, like some somebody wrote this this story that has has never been written before. 
that's my my inter my you know like my creation yeah um yeah i think it, yeah cover songs is a totally apropos comparison but but, but i lo like there are certain cover songs i love that i love more than the originals yeah, and usually the ones know. right yeah and usually the ones i like are are usually done in a way where the band does their own kind of spin on right. it where it becomes very unique to that artist and and it's more like them expressing a song they really love yeah as opposed to like and then there's, and I think the analogy carries through because there's also equivalent to this at conventions where there's also just cover bands that are just wholesale covering mm -hmm. a song, just playing every part exactly the same. Right. And, you know, that's usually the type of music that you'd go to a bar and you'd maybe enjoy because you're like, I love this song, but you're not yeah. going to like remember the name of the band. Yeah. You you know? All of them on tour, you know, like that's never going <laughs> to. Yeah. Like, they might, I mean, some people do, you know, like, I, I guess we can really grow, you know, to be, you know, they can get enough attention doing that one thing, but I think you're never going to quite reach the same level of appreciation or fandom from somebody when they like this new thing that isn't like everything else, you know? Yeah. It's, it's a weird, I mean, like, I don't know, do any of, I don't know if I have a solid answer on that one. That's a complicated question, but it's interesting because I feel like, almost every artist and cartoonist I bump into has that, mm -hmm. like that juggle of like, you know, you want to like, once again, none of us are like raking in like, you know, billions of dollars a year or something. So it's like, we, you know, the, there is an investment in even getting there. Like, even if you're a guest at the show, you still have to get a flight, right? you know, or, or drive there. Yeah, you're spending um, gas or your time, you know what I mean? Like this is time you could be using on anything really, you know? Yeah, and, you yeah, know, you like, could be freelancing. It's a conscious decision to to invest in this thing, you know? Yeah, I, I think it's definitely, I think it depends on where you are in your career. And the more you refine it, the more you just, you have to make decisions. Yeah. I think it reminds me of how, like right after college, all I had in my portfolio was like classwork, you know, and it was super apparent, you know, like they were all the same assignments. Everybody's portfolios kind of looked the same because you had to do an alligator and you had to do a color study of this, you know. Um, but then you start to build your own things and start to kind of have your own self-directed projects. You start to replace those things. And you start to like push the other stuff aside. And I think that's definitely like kind of like a good way to go about it. Is if you need to, if you need that thing, because it is really hard to stare at a blank page and decide, okay, go, you know, like, what do I do? You know, like that, it's really hard to be creative when you don't have that type of parameter. So I think it's a good starting point, but it shouldn't be your end goal. I mean, like, I can't name one artist that I, that I really, really love that, that is just known for copying other people, you know, <laughs> or just doing covers of other things, you know, like, yeah, like yeah, a, a, a good example, like Gene Yang did a, a brilliant, job writing the avatar comics oh yeah, yeah yeah when i but the reason i know gene yang's name is not because he worked on the avatar comics it's because yeah, it was he, his own stuff yeah he had definitely yeah. proven himself like well beyond by doing his own work and it's amazing you know like yeah it, it, i think it's a really interesting place right now where i think mike manola was talking about this how um back in the day uh like maybe in the 90s early 2000s like you would make your own indie comic and it would get enough press that it would kind of get around and people would kind of acknowledge it. And then one of the big two, you know, Marvel or DC or Dark Horse would say like, you know what, you're good. Let's, let's have you try out a new title. And oftentimes it feels like a lot of creators are doing the opposite now. People that are well-established that have worked on big titles have gone back and done their passion projects, you know, yeah. like, uh, I don't know if you know Dustin Nguyen, like he does really amazing watercolors. Like he has his own, um, he does Descender with Jeff Lemire. And he was, you know, like posted on Instagram how gratifying it feels to do your own property. Like he invented, helped invent these characters. He's worked on Batman and like yeah. all these really well-known characters. And he does a great job with them. They're super recognizable. I could know his, I would see his style immediately. But it's amazing that even having reached that level, the appreciation for the craft isn't quite the same when you make your own character as yeah. opposed to the, adding to a legacy, even if it's a legacy character as, yeah. as some of the main ones. Yeah, and I think, uh, like, Scott, you were going to say, what's, I think you got cut off with, uh, or you, did you I have something? Robot out. Just interrupt me if I start to robot, okay? Okay. <laughs> okay. 
Um, I was just going to say it's it's hard to make that transition though. If you're starting to sell fan art, and you want to transition because <laughs> there goes all your money basically, you know. Right. So it's really hard. It's really hard if you if you're start off selling fan art and then you try to try to phase that stuff out. But yeah, yeah I mean it's. Yeah, you know, it's just something you gotta have a passion for. If you really have a passion for creating your own stuff and want to share that with people, sometimes you gotta take those hits, you know, and mm -hmm. and just keep at it. And but I've seen people that do it are, are massively successful. Mm -hmm. Am I still okay? As yeah, as yeah, you're good. Uh -huh. Okay. And there, there's certain things that you know, if you, if and different people have different reasons for not wanting to do fan art. Some people just some people it's just because they want to make their own stuff. Some people because there's some legal issues or whatever. But you know, there there are certain things you can do that 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 aren't affected by that that people still know, like especially like fantasy artists, because you know, fairies, people know fairies, people love fairies, and you're not infringing on anyone's copyright or anything. So there's certain things like that that even if you're if you're not doing quote fan art, it still relates to people. Yeah. Um, and my stuff definitely relates to certain people. There's just not enough of those people engines. That's why I <laughs> I keep saying I want like a like uh, like science convention or something. Right, like that right. Because yeah. that everyone there would probably love what I'm doing. Plus, there's no one else doing that kind of thing there. Right, there's probably yeah. no one else selling prints or anything. So, unfortunately, those are, cost a lot more to exhibit at. You know, there's yeah. like two or three grand a table. Yeah. So yeah, because yeah. it's like so, trade show kind of stuff. It's yeah, it's, right. it's it's interesting i've even thought recently because i i didn't expect it this has just been an organic thing and has little to do with, with like illustration but it's gonna tie in so bear with me uh -huh. but um it's uh so I've, I've started doing like a band and it just kind of started out as like a I, I used to play music i miss playing music and then my friends and i just decided hey let's play music and we got a gig and now we're recording and all of this is just organically happening um, with like us just being like saying yes to things like so a gig came up and we're like sure we'll play you know and a guy was like can we record you and then we were like yes sure <laughs> like and um, but what I realized was like I was like okay so if this continues it may not because bands are like that too I mean but um, but I, but so far it's we're having a lot of fun and sure. if I was realizing like a venue, like a gig at a bar is a great weird area to sell something like my weird comic. Like that's actually a really good in to just sell auto bio comics. So I was like, I can start like, so I already have this like slightly Machiavellian thing boiling in the back of my head that <laughs> if, if we continue to play and we get this demo cut and stuff and we play gigs, I can sell comics at gigs. Uh -huh. And then when I start conventioning, I can play gigs around the convention around the convention yeah yeah because almost every cartoonist likes rock and roll wants to go to parties afterwards mm. and that's even that gives me another opportunity to sell books <laughs> like right. yeah, so yeah. it can it can all kind of start um, interrelating and it's kind of some outside of the box type ways to do it but um, but what's funny is at the same time some of those little plans like even selling directly to stores get really hurt when like like there's the news right now that meltdown in LA is closed. That's right. I just heard and about that. That's that, so bad. Well, yeah. I didn't know that. Well, I listened to the the Pod Sequentialism podcast. Um, I don't know if you guys heard it. Uh, it's Matt Kennedy who I guess he used to curate for Meltdown or whatever. Right. And wow. he said he left them, but I didn't know that they were not going to be there, which is bum yeah. a bummer because I was going to try to go there last time I, when I was just over in L.A. And now I guess I won't get the chance. It's really sad. It's been there for so long, and it's it's been like not just a comic book store. Like, it's a comedy place, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, tons of events. I, I used to do their, their Nerd Melt, uh, the little zine fest, um, and where they, they totally liked promoting people who were – super independent, you know, and doing their own thing. It's really unfortunate that they're not going to be there anymore because it's been there for like 25 years. There are core stores, like there are just certain stores, like the Comic Bug, I think you're, you're, you know, is one of your core stores, Chris. Right, right, and, yeah, one of my pals does, yeah. Yeah, and there are these core people who kind of run key comic shops, like I, I not that, like all comic shops are kind of key comic <laughs> shops because it's such a hard business to run and most people running them are running them at a loss just because yeah. they love comics. I mean, everything, it, everything is local, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's a local place, so it's like... But these are like, there, you know, yeah. 
yeah, there are hubs and that's one hub gone. And it, it, yeah. it just made me a little nervous. Cause like, by the time I finish my graphic novel, <laughs> like there may not be stores to sell direct to, you know, like, cause yeah, that. I remember they, they were so nice. I actually took some of my Selma circus comics and yeah, they, they, they bought some for me, you know, like to sell there. Yeah. You know, like I didn't, it's not like I was making money off them, but like the fact that I got to say that it was in a shop that, that felt yeah. great, you know? Yeah, and, and I that people that 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 encourage that type of independent spirit. That's like it's one less place. It's a little sad that it's that it's faded away. You know? Yeah, it's it's a weird one. But but so like um, so that's I don't know. But like conventions are interesting in the fact that like to me it's going to be interesting because I've never done WonderCon. I've never done like a lot of the bigger cons. Mm -hmm. And um, I I'm, I'm curious, like, do you approach? WonderCon differently than you would, let's say, if you went to SBX or something like that. Yeah. Like, would there be a different approach in the way that you're tabling and what you're selling? That kind mm -hmm. of like, same with you, Scott, too, because you do like, I mean, like Phoenix is not a small convention. And you no, I won't. Oh, I was just gonna before Chris answers that question. I just wanted to, from what I heard about WonderCon, is it, that's a convention that's a little more about making connections and things, and maybe not selling stuff as much, or maybe I heard that wrong. I don't know. I I like that one. That one's a nice balance of size and people looking for independent stuff. It's one of my favorites, honestly. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. So, because I think like I heard a lot of industry industry insiders are there, and it's really a good place to make connections. Yeah, it might be so, too. Yeah, I think yeah. for the most part, I stay busy enough that I don't really, <laughs> I'm not really, you know, going out and talking to too many people. But um, right, okay. I'm trying to think back. You know, it's kind of hard to think. I think some of my first licensed professional work came through conventions. It might have been a WonderCon or it might have been Kamikaze, but um, you know, you know, it it, it was WonderCon. So yeah, you know what? I I just have kind of forgot about the instances, but you're right. One of my first ins kind of doing professional illustration for properties was like through a happenstance. Somebody was browsing the aisles at at WonderCon. Yeah, so I guess you're right. Yeah, it is it is a good good place to make connections. But I, I in addition, I think it's a good place for independent people who have a mix of things that's both new and without getting lost into something as enormous as like a uh, San Diego. You know. Do you keep track of like how much like original stuff you sell as opposed to like license work or yeah yeah or... I do. yeah I, I started doing that um, in the last few years I kind of wish I'd been doing it longer I kind of wish I'd been doing this from the beginning so I get a trend you know a, a good idea of what the trends are for each place but um, yeah I, I keep a good track of what moves just so I know how much how many prints to make of each thing the next year. How do you, how, I, I actually kind of want to know like a rough idea of how you do that. Cause I, that's one thing that I wish I had done. And right. when, uh, you mentioned this, like, I think like two years ago, you uh, mentioned yeah. that to me. And, like it's, and super, I, it's super boring, but it, cause, but I found it super useful. It's, it's basically marketing strategy, you know, just keep it on, on a Google docs and um, I'll just like print out a sheet that has a label, like names of all the, the prints and items that I have, whether it's comics or t-shirts or, or uh, buttons, and I'll just make make a little tally mark whenever something sells, and at the end, kind of kind of uh, add it all up, and and year over year, you can kind of see like what stuff moved, what didn't, you know. Yeah, That's it's really helpful. Like it's super boring because I didn't you know, like I hate doing that stuff. But yeah, when it comes to like, well, I'm investing hundreds of dollars sometimes into these things, into prints and travel. I might as well try to market some of it, you know, or try yeah. to do research for it, you know. And and like you were saying, like um, that, there's this weird thing because like I'm all about authenticity, but at the same time, like you know, um, you you can also be smart and authentic. You right. Know? Like, yeah. I'm like, and, it doesn't mean that I like the stuff, and then, you know, it doesn't change my mind about things. You know, like I still like it. You know. Yeah, and like the cool thing about that is that can help cut through some of the objectivity problems with right. just being an artist because we're so connected to our own work. Yeah, you're right. Um, like there might be a print that you're printing, you know, 50 copies of before a convention. You only need two, you know, yeah, right? Or, exactly. or or maybe the print just shouldn't come to the yeah, convention. Yeah. And sometimes it's the case, yeah. And that analysis, like being able to analyze and going, like, oh wow, this hasn't sold in like four shows, right? 
and I'm still investing in prints, like that's kind of silly. You know? Yeah. Although I don't think I'm ever without comics, though. I think I, it doesn't matter where I'm going, I'm always going to have some on hand. Well, that's where, like, the passion has to come through. Right, like, exactly. Like, I don't yeah. I just never know. Like, I'm just wanting to share the story, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, and that ties back to, like, what I, like my scheme that I may not, I, I don't know, we'll see in a year, but, um, but my scheme, like, I know going into it will most likely be a loss, like, <laughs> probably the first year. Mm -hmm. Um and and so like but the, but to me it's like that's even that is a business decision that's very personal right because of the fact that at, as a business like if you it, like if you want to push something that's going to be harder to sell uh -huh. then you got to be willing to take a loss right yeah. but at least i'm going to go into it kind of aware of that mm -hmm. so i won't be caught like blindsided and hopefully i'll plan it and maybe be able to um, accommodate for that loss you know mm -hmm. And you'd be surprised, you know, like business plans that account for an initial loss for yeah. sometimes years, you know, of of investment. You know, I think that that kind of applies, you know, to, to passion projects because it's like it, the same rules apply to that. Sometimes it requires a lot of like a lot of runway. Before yeah. It off. Yeah. yeah, and so like that's the, that to me that's um, I think it, I think it's awesome to tally and get like an analysis because like let's say there is a print that you're like I don't care if it sells it or not like mm -hmm. I want to push this thing. It'll right. also give you more information on like am I effectively marketing the thing I'm trying to sell? Yeah, yeah. and that's that's a like all of that's beneficial. So like I, I never think it's a bad idea for artists like you know especially young artists like to sell their work because mm -hmm. you're a business at the end of the day and. Like what we're all aiming for, I think on on here is to uh, at some point be a business that's like, I mean that would be so cool if like, Chris, if your business was the Sunless Circus and that's uh -huh. it, I mean that would be a great scenario. Uh -huh. um, and yeah, that would be Scott, cool. Yeah, yeah, Scott, like Cirque Cirque Works, like um, if if Cirque Works was like the primary function of Cirque Works was Young and the Dead, that would be amazing, right? <laughs> so. Well, is it having, is it having, oh, go ahead. I would say no. Uh, I was going to say, in my case, not really, um, because, I mean, because everything else I do is also my original stuff. Oh, yeah. And, I, and if, if you watch any of my videos, I say I do robots, aliens, zombies, and other imminent threats to humanity. And, like, zombies is the last thing. So it's mm -hmm. like I love drawing robots. I love drawing aliens and all that kind of stuff. So to yeah. me, Young in the Dead, I love comics. But it might not always be on the day when I wrap up this. Maybe I'll do a robot comic or something. But it'll well, all so all that stuff. I don't really would. I wouldn't want to focus just on Young and the Dead. I guess. No, no, no. And I th that actually I think would apply across the board too. Like quarterly stories is not necessarily going to be the only thing I ever do. You know, um, and I think for Chris, like Sunless Circus may not be the only comic. But if it were about comics, is what I'm getting at. You know, mm -hmm. like that would be cool. And I think that's where we're all trying to gear. Um, you know, where it's like comics are more like one of those top tier items that, that you're like, when you're doing your tally, it's like, I, I'm, I made the bulk of my income off the comics, you know, that would be that cool. would be nice because like we said, the comics are the most time, there's the most time investment. There's the right. most, probably the most money because time is money. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if the comics did, did the best, that would be great because I mean, it takes what, you know, it could take maybe a day or so to do a print and it would just take for me, you know, not straight, but it takes me a year to put out a comic book because I just right, work yeah. out whatever I have time. Yeah. So. yeah, I think it's yeah, definitely like a long term investment thing. But I, I yeah, I do I do enjoy the diversity of stuff too though, you know, and yeah. it's weird because I've got I've got other stories I've I've been thinking about and I have notes for. And I just wish the comics didn't take so long to do. <laughs> you know, like yeah. I just wish I had like a clone or, or like somebody who draws similarly that is willing to put in just as much sweat, you know, um, to do this thing. But it's it's really hard. Yeah, it's uh, that's a challenge of mine too. Because like the the thing I want to do right now is probably going to be a couple gra at least a couple graphic novels worth, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's daunting when I have those moments of like like I want to do. Um, I think it would be cool to do some like actual news stuff where it's like you you do investigative journalism in comics because like 
um, I, I just read like a Joe Sacco thing like last year and was like, that's so cool. Like not yeah. his take on it was great, but just the idea of doing the job of a journalist in cartooning is so exciting. Yeah. And then at the same time, like there's other areas like science fiction and um, children's books and like all sorts of stuff that like, like I'd love to do a young adult graphic novel that's like, mm -hmm. you know, a little more fantastical and fun. There's right. so many things. And yet, like, you know, if I do the math, like I'll probably be doing quarterly stories in six years from now, you know, because yeah. um, comics are just a long game. But yeah. because of that, like I, that's what got me thinking about like the idea of paring down what I'm showing because I, I realized like I I do want to eventually be known for whatever property I'm attached to. Right. That's my own. Like, um, and so like at some point I'd like it to be that like somebody leaves my booth and they don't know me by like Josh Kemble illustrations or whatever, which is great for an income. Mm -hmm. But it's not, um, that's, that, like, I'd, I'd rather them be like, hey, that's that guy who did the autobio book uh -huh. about faith and mental illness. Like, that would be a way better, to me, I feel like I'd be more effectively marketing if, if I could do that. Um, so. But it's, it's such a but juggle. People, I think, kind of get tied into whatever they're working on, too. You know, like, some people get known for it, where their name becomes synonymous with the work. Yeah. And so I think there's... It's not. It doesn't necessarily have to be a either or. Like I think, you you can have both of those things depending yeah. on how it's received. Yeah, and I think I think um, that like for me, I was just realizing. Um, I don't remember. I think it was that we were prepping for a trade show at my day job where I where I art direct, and I was looking at the preparation of the trade show and how much it's all targeted to like specific items that they're trying to sell for the year. Right. And, and like it's targeted on their market and, and their branding and what they want to be known for. And I realized like myself, I haven't done that as effectively as I could for my own property that I want to see succeed. Right. You know, and yeah. that's, that's the part where it was just like, for, for me, it was like a personal, like almost like a challenge, but it's also curiosity. Like I'm really, um, like I want to hear how, how, like I, I'd love to hear follow ups. We should try to touch base and do a follow up app, like a convention wrap up. Oh, speaking of those things, like uh, when it comes to like actual knowledgeable research, do you remember yeah. the Devastator? Yeah. The, so I don't know if you ever got the email invites, but they do a thing. It's really really great. They're basically just uh, out of just adding to the community, but um, they have a thing where if you're a participant and have been tabling at conventions for a while, you have the option to take take uh, take part in a survey. And it's basically like how you did that year. And basically you fill out the form and your reward is basically seeing how everybody did. And it's all anonymous. Like you don't, nobody actually has to tell exactly how much they made. Like your name isn't attached to like your your numbers. Yeah, so you can see raw numbers for the convention. Right, That's but like amazing. averages of like people did better better or worse than last year. You know, it's really neat. I think it's such one of those really amazing things that kind of keeps this keep the community alive of people like like so few people in this in the artist community are very like cutthroat, you know? Like I'm very willing to share my experience with people because I want people to do well too, you know? Yeah. But similarly, I think in this case like people are willing to share their experience of here's how I did, you know, and how did you do? You know, like cause that's that's such a common thing that that is a topic of conversation at conventions and uh, I just thought it was really neat because that, that exists and I think it's been really helpful for me too and trying to make decisions like where do I want if I want to travel out of state which is the one I want to do you know yeah is it, it like and they'll ask you know like did you sell more prints comics etc hats you know like um, that type of knowledge I think that you really can only can get firsthand um, it exists out there and, and so much of it you can actually freely people are super helpful. I think it's really nice to know that people are out there willing to help. Yeah, Scott, do you have a method for like tallying your your sales and stuff? I'm sure you do. It's, but. it's pretty close to what Chris was describing. I've got basically just a printout of all the, you know, all my different items. And then I've got, you know, I just put tally marks on the side. One of the things that I 
I don't know if this would be any faster or not, but uh, one of the things I was thinking about doing was making like just little stickers. Um, but sometimes even even taking the time, like if you're real busy, sometimes even taking the time to put those tally marks down, sometimes it's hard to do. Because like you get yeah. a bunch of sales at once, so like, oh, what did I sell? What did I sell? I, I so agree. one thing I think I'm, one thing I might do is just get little tiny stickers with the names of the items on, especially for prints, and put to stick those on the back. Something that would peel off easy. So as soon as I sell that print, I just peel that sticker off and stick it somewhere, oh, and then yeah. and then I can put them all. Then I put it next to the item or whatever eventually. So that way, there's no doubt on because there's so many times where I'm like, oh man, what did I just sell? I forgot. Yeah, it is a really good call. Yeah, it could happen just like right after you've. You just like the person left. I'm like, what did that person buy? I have no idea. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's uh, I definitely have like, yeah, lost track of stuff. That's a pretty smart way to do it, though. Yeah, I haven't done it yet, but I think I might do that. I say that, but then it's usually one of those things that I'm trying to get ready right before a con. And I gotta put all these things up, and I've got so many things. I'm like, and naturally, some things I just have to say, yeah, I don't have time to do that right yeah. now. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you have to make sure that you have. Like unique stickers for each item, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, well, I mean, I've already got the. I can just cut and paste all that information from my little tally sheets, right? And then print them out on, you know, print them out on stickers, you know, yeah. like little labels, like the, assuming that they'll come off easy enough. Because if they don't yeah, come off, the thing, then but then if they come off too easily, then you don't want to lose. Right, them, right. You know? Yeah, true. And then, true, and then true. once you collect the stickers, you want to make sure you keep that. You don't want to lose that pile because that's yeah, all your, yeah. That's all your. Because you could just have a blank book and just just pop them right on that book oh, when you're done. Just go through oh, all yeah, the stickers. Yeah, yeah. that's kind of yeah. clever. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, I I do a yeah. I oftentimes I'll have that printout, but. And when you're really busy and you might not know where that sheet is, you're just going to be like, oh, I can't find it right now. I'm just going to make a tally here or write it down. And it's super hard because, yeah, if you don't have it with you, then then basically like that that moment might pass you by. Yeah. And some of that stuff, like I used to have everything like like when people pay credit card on Square, I had all the different items. Right. And then sometimes I'm in such a hurry, I can't even go. I don't have time to go look for the different items. So now I kind of nailed it down to either just print. Right. But then <laughs> eventually I got to remember which print it is so I can like, reorder yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, so, I, I have the same thing. I, I've gone in and, and labeled all the products, but I can't scroll down sometimes fast enough to find it. And it's just yeah. easier to just write it down. Or sometimes I'll just, sometimes I'll just enter the price and say, right. okay, there's $50 worth of stuff. Yeah. I'll charge you $50. Okay. I'm curious. Do you do you do quantity discounts when people buy lots of stuff? Uh, yeah, yeah. I usually have. I you know. I mean, it's it's usually with. It depends what it is. It's usually with prints, and then also people buy a lot of stuff while throwing buttons and stuff too. Right. right um, yeah. But but yeah, it's usually you know if if it's if it's twenty dollars a print, two for thirty or something like that. Right. Right. You yeah. know. Because that's another thing when I'm doing the square thing, when you have a bunch of items and I want to give a discount, it makes it, I mean, it, it, yeah, it is a function, in there, but it just takes more time to do. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's easier just not to have to enter all that stuff in and just right. put the price and <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's nice for the people so they know what they bought, you know, um, if it says, but, you know, I don't know. I think, I don't know, I think we probably care more than the people are getting the thing. You're, yeah, <laughs> you're probably right. Mm. Yeah, they're like, they're just happy they have this thing, and yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's so it's so Plus fascinating. They got the thing, so they know what they bought. It's so right. fascinating how hard it is to kind of stay on point with something like even just this simple track list of how many books you've sold. Yeah. You know, because of the fact that there's that like kind of thing that happens at a convention where you've been standing all day you're engaging with people all the time and it's kind of a, like it's it's actually kind of fun once you get in the flow of it. Yeah. And uh, it's a little bit of a rush. And then it's like when a convention is over, you feel like you've ran like a, you know, like a 10 mile <laughs> marathon. Right. You know, um, the whole time too. So your throat's all messed up too. You know? Yeah. And, and, uh, it's, it's a little overwhelming and it's like, it's, there's so many moments at the, like that just resonated with me. Like, cause I was remembering so many moments of like people coming in and buying a bunch of stuff and walking away and being like, wait, what, what just, and then you're engaging with the next person, you know? <laughs> Yeah, so I you, like it. You want to give yeah. them attention too and be sincere about every like your interaction. And that that takes energy. It takes a lot of takes a toll, you know. Yeah, but like that's so like the sticker or some kind of tracking thing like that is a really smart 
move, Scott. Like that's that's a really good call. Because yeah. because that that bypasses that like kind of zone out moment of like what right. what just happened. Okay, next person. Yeah. And I I think that transitions is something that um, Chris, you're really good at at conventions that I've observed. Um, you are really good at engaging people and staying really present. Um, and and I know that it's not artificial, but I also know it's not like unintentional. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I do so, like talking to people, you know, I do like, I do feel like that's the one place where I feel like there's the fact that they're at a convention already means we have something in common. Yeah. You know, so I think like, I do enjoy being there, you know, Yeah. but I think oftentimes I kind of, I think I empathize with people who are a little shy because I was that way for sure. And so when I, if I can find a topic of conversation that makes people feel at ease, I kind of, you know, like to use that as a, as just a as a gateway and really to kind of get their opinion about stuff too you know like it's it's always fun to hear different conversations that way yeah and i think that's that's a good point because like when i especially um i still get nervous like like my my first time at ncs i felt so nervous because there's all these people that i've totally seen their work and i'm a huge fan of their right. work and they're just kind of coming up to me like, so what do you do? You know, like, how, how are you doing? Uh -huh. And I'm trying to kind of play it cool. Even at, even now, after I've, I've had that kind of moment more often than like when I was an undergrad, you know, yeah. but I still vividly remember like feeling so nervous before approaching somebody at a booth who's there to sell their stuff. Yeah. They want you to talk to them. you know. <laughs> yeah. But you just feel nervous and you want to say something cool that leaves uh -huh. a nice impression for them. You know, at least for me, that's how I'd feel. I'd be like, Can I say, <laughs> I'd, walk, I'd even walk away from like buying something and be like, did I just come across like an idiot? Like, uh -huh. what did I say to them? You know, cause I was nervous. Right. And, um, I think that gets back to that empathizing. It's cool. I think it is smart to like put yourself in those people's shoes and try to draw them out and make them feel comfortable. Cause like right. a lot of the time, if you see somebody kind of weirded out by your booth, they're probably just a socially awkward person mm -hmm. cause they're at a comic convention. You know what I mean? Like we're like fans of comics are not like always like the most social people, you know? I think and so, like it's, you know, at this point, conventions have really expanded out to include so many different types that kind of for sure around, for sure but i mean i think if you're going by the history of it you know the people that are more bookish and want to read stories by themselves tend to not have the experience of people who are super social butterflies by nature yeah and and that's and that's the thing like especially if you're trying to push your book to readers mm -hmm. readers a lot of readers are introverts and so like coming up with ways to make them comfortable at your booth and like kind of like engage them in conversation let them l make it known that like you're not greater than them like that you're there mm -hmm. and you like sincerely want to know how they're doing yeah. and how the convention's yeah. going and like hey is there anything cool here you know because like well, the thing is it's it's really true though because when i ask people how they're enjoying the convention i i want details because you don't get to leave the table yeah you know what i mean like i really want to vicariously enjoy the place because you're kind of stuck doing this thing. You're there to work and you know, like you, you want to, I do, I do want to just nerd out and see stuff. And once, once in a while, I've gone to a few conventions like that where I'm not tabling and it's so much fun, you know, yeah. you don't get the same enjoyment experience because you're there to, to do something else, you know? So when I do talk to people, it, it comes from a really sincere place of wanting to know what they're interested in. And, yeah. And during my break, I get an idea of what's on the floor because I'm not, I can't waste yeah. time browsing. I just want to know what's cool and get straight to it. And then, cause I have to go back into the bathroom break or something, you know? Yeah. And I, th I think that's a key thing. Cause like, to me, my experience is like part of why I'm not even going to conventions until I finish my book is because I've had such positive experience from that kind of interaction at conventions too, where it's like, there, there's, there's usually at conventions, there's like one or two, like things that everybody who cruises by the booth happens to have like mm -hmm. or that that sparks my interest right and i'm like so i'll ask them about products they bought that they're right. holding so i'm like where the hell did you get that who's selling that that's amazing yeah and i and it, i'm literally like gathering information for that break yeah to like buy that stuff and i've discovered so many cool like indie artists that i would have never known about just from the process of being at a convention Mm -hmm. Because like a lot of the times the type of person who would be drawn to 
go to your booth where you're selling stuff that you like <laughs> right. and you're passionate about have already bought stuff that you would like and be passionate about. Yeah. So they're it's going like, you know. yeah, to I think the only issue with that is like I have to be really cautious when I do convention to not spend everything I earn. <laughs> right, yeah, me too. <laughs> you know, um, and then end up, but but that's the fun of, I don't know, that's the fun of the whole thing too. It's like a vacation. You yeah, know? that's true. Yeah. yeah. Scott, do you get to see stuff at conventions or are you, are you, do you have help at the booth? Yeah, well, I usually, like, in the beginning, my girlfriend would always, she, she used to help me out, like, every day. And then it, gradually it's like, okay, we've done this enough. I'll come one day. <laughs> so, right, right. Yeah. But, but, yeah, so there's usually a day a day or two that she'll come and help me out. And then, right. uh, and then I try to take the time to, to go and, and walk the floor. And then sometimes, because I do YouTube videos, sometimes I'll – bring my camera and everything oh, out cool. and kind of get some footage. And sometimes I'll even have time to talk to like last, last year, there's a video on my, on my uh, channel from last year at Phoenix Comic Con where I talked to just a comic book creators and I just oh. went and did real quick interviews with them and everything. So, so I try to do that. I don't have, a, I mean, I would love to be able to do like go check out some panels and things like that, but right. I, I don't have time for that. Yeah. Um, those are just too much yeah. of an investment, you know? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I, I may try to make the rounds, you know, but it's you know, if I can, you know. I, I have a weird question regarding that. Like, so have you noticed any sales differences when your your girlfriend watches the booth? Because for me, I've actually noticed when my wife watches the booth, the sales increase. You got a booth yeah, sometimes, Josh, you know? yeah. sometimes there's that, yeah. And I, I was like, that. I was really shocked, but I think she's just better with people and interacting than I am. So I was yeah. like, like <laughs> I've uh, I've joked that she's kind of like my secret weapon at conventions, you know. It's well, like, it's kind of cool when you come back to your booth and it's like, oh, we sold this one time though. I <laughs> one time I I left my booth and uh, I came back and somebody had decided, you know how people will come and they'll stick, just leave stuff on your booth, they'll, they'll leave their trash or their drinks or whatever. Right. Well, somebody thought it was would be a good idea. And like I said before, I had this kind of convent, this uh, conveyor belt set up as this booth. And it was wow. this whole wraparound thing and everything. Yeah. And somebody decided, oh, I'm gonna get a picture, so I'm just gonna sit up on your booth oh, and geez. the whole like whole thing like just tumbled over. Oh. And, uh, and then these people were like, oh, let's get out of here. And they just took off. Oh, so I came back, and of course, all the, the other exhibitors were trying to help. And you know, people that were like, "I can't believe that person did that," and they're trying to put it back together. So I came, I came back to that one time. That, yeah. So oh, sometimes you get those people. I thought this was gonna be like a silly, funny story. That sucks. Dude. Uh -huh. Well, in hindsight, it was kind of funny, and it always makes a good story every time they tell it because that, it's just like that's never happened. Yeah, before. yeah, that's crazy, dude. That sucks, but. I mean, at least people are, are there to help, you know? That's nice that yeah, yeah. People can come, the, the village comes together. And, you know, yeah. like, oh, man, that's, that's like one step, <laughs> one step away from, like, a, sm like a smoldering crater. I'm like, what happened? Yeah, <laughs> and I just can't believe, I mean, if it's one thing to do that, and, I mean, obviously that's kind of not in good form to, like, sit on somebody's table right. to try yeah. to take a picture or whatever, but to just not apologize or bother to help and just, like, yeah. take off. That's that's just yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that'll tie into like one other thing that we've reiterated on all of these things, but it's a small community, the comics community. Yeah, so don't sure. be a dick. <laughs> like, be a yeah. nice person. Yeah. Yeah. Because you know, if you're kind of rude to like, like, like for instance, like, and honestly, I fell prey to this my first convention. I'll just say one of my kind of dick moments at oh. like. So I went to a couple of conventions, and I would just express how I felt about books and this is like before I really started making comics so I didn't quite understand like the work that goes into making comics I was just as a fan being like oh yeah I like that artist but that that book kind of sucks you know that kind of talk yeah 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 but I would have that like way too often with with uh, like cartoonists that I really admired not realizing like I'm bashing their buddy you know yeah, yeah. or like, like no, yeah, it might unknowingly be talking to somebody who was very close to this, you know. Yeah, like that—that that might be the person that, like, when they were midway through their book, like, was reliant. Like, the person you're talking to could be the person who was coaching them through the making of that because it's such a like labor to make these right. things. Yeah, and so like, 
Uh, that would be a big piece of advice because I've experienced that a lot at conventions. Um, having people come up to me and being like, "Oh, this cartoonist sucks," and you're like, "I know that." Guy. Like, you don't want to tell them. <laughs> that feel awkward, but you're like the whole time your impression of this, like especially young cartoonists, it's like your impression just goes, "Woo!" Because you're like, "Man, you're like really crap talking somebody who's a good person," you know. And and so something to keep in mind when you're at convention that I would say is just like it's a really small community yeah, um, yeah. like Meltdown's a perfect example I like literally last night met a guy who got his publisher through the owner of Meltdown calling that publisher and being like you need to publish this guy yeah and I can totally believe it yeah like how else do people find things it's often recommended yeah. that are personal you know so imagine if he had gone into the like, if this guy I met yesterday had gone into that store and was talking to the owner of Meltdown and being like, I hate this publisher so much. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The owner of that store <laughs> is friends with that publisher and he might have just effectively burnt a really beautiful bridge. Sure, you know? yeah. So it's, I, you know, not that you should always be fake or anything, but just, just always keep in mind, like it's a small community and, so like be nice to other cartoonists be cool to other cartoonists if you knock over somebody's booth setup if that guy becomes a cartoonist <laughs> and scott like runs into him like i don't think scott's gonna want to hang out with him at like a drink and draw you know because it's like you just knocked over somebody's booth and bail and and right. <laughs> that, that's just something to keep in mind because like a lot of fans of cartoonists are cartoonists mm -hmm. and so it's like that's just like for me, I would have wanted to hear that because I wasn't aware of how small it was really until I lived in Portland. Yeah. And that's where I was like, holy crap, like just like there's like two or three degrees of separation between like honestly artists in general, but definitely. Yeah, I was going to say comics. like I could even expand that to just creative endeavors in general. You know, I don't think, I think like, I mean, I have tastes. I like things and I don't like things, but how I speak about them comes from a different place than somebody who will just bash something without yeah. giving criticism, you know? Like, even a really bad movie, I'll, I'll still appreciate the fact that it's made, you know? Yeah. Because I, I've never made a movie, you know? Like, yeah. like, the fact that I understand how much process goes into scripting and filming and storyboarding and production design and costume yeah. and, you know, like, it's a lot of work. Even the crappiest thing is a lot more work than people expect, especially if they haven't tried before. Yeah, and it's a lot more chaotic. Like the right. process, it's like so much more. To, yeah, it's not just one person that does this thing. Yeah. It's thousands of people. Yeah. So the reason why you might not like, like something isn't because of you can't you can't shift blame to just one thing. It's if you understand the difficulty of making something, you'll much more appreciate the complexity of the complexities of what made it good or bad. Yeah, like in film, like most of the dudes I know who work in that industry kind of describe if they worked on something that was good as it's like the arrival of it being good. It was right. almost like more of an accident than anything. It's, a, it's, because it's so thing. crazy. Right. It's just a crazy endeavor and there's so many cogs. Yeah. That it's it's crazy that anything good comes out of it. Yeah. The fact that it <laughs> you know, exists is a is a miracle. You know, like it's well, a, yeah. yeah. I mean like it's crazy to like it just from vlogging, like just to edit something like, and I don't, I barely edit. Like Scott could probably speak to this more because he's got these beautiful edits and his, his vlog is it very cared for and, and well presented and stuff. But just the amount of work it is to just clip out like a word from a video and have, try to have it stream like flow effectively, just that is a headache. So I can like to me, it's amazing that like even in a bad movie, they can still do a sequence where it's like it looks like that guy's getting hit by a car or running mm -hmm. away or like there's a fight sequence and it actually looks like they're fighting. You know, yeah. there's so much craziness to it that yeah, that's totally true. But I also think that comes from making stuff, right? Yeah, when, I think I just appreciate making things in all forms. You know, even if it's not something I really understand, because I think like. Yeah, I think you just really appreciate the the world is everything is handmade, like your T-shirt, right? You know, like it's yeah. A, yeah, somebody's hands and minds did it, and I think it's so much easier to criticize something when you haven't tried doing it yourself. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah. But I mean, I would definitely say for conventions, yeah, if you're like boothing, try not to be like, yeah, I hate that comic. That comic sucks. Because, <laughs> like I said, it, you never know. Maybe. 
the person you're talking to just had a beer with that guy like the day right. before, yeah. you know? But personally, I think I, I tend, to, tend to guide conversations for things that you like. You know, I don't really bond with people over a mutual hatred of something. Yeah. Like, it's we have similar tastes, you know, like, yeah. and I think we talk more about that than then I hate this equally with you, you know what I mean? Yeah, I that, form, that makes I sense. Those are kind of like the you know, the least common denominator conversations with people is when you bond over something that you don't like. Yeah, that's and a good it's point. much more aspirational to keep the focus on something that you appreciate the work that went into something. Equally, yeah. You know, like I think that's so much better because it inspires you to do something rather than tear something down, you know? Well, and that's the cool thing is like, I think, um, that kind of that kind of approach like you'll end up with something out of it not right. that you're going into it for yeah. something but the point being you come out like inspired refreshed um but you know if if it's just um like a complaining session or something it's like mm -hmm. you that rarely comes out well right like at yeah. the end you don't usually walk away with like i can't wait to work on my comic now that i've bashed <laughs> like you know something it's usually right. more like it, it, it like it's like the two fires kind of feed each other like yeah, so yeah. um there's the fire of creativity and it's like when you and this is the beauty of conventioning um <laughs> is you, you're surrounded by creators mm -hmm. and there's it's like a battery for when you get home and it's just you and the art table you know yeah, it totally is yeah when you even when i see something really well done whether it's illustration or a movie or something if it's really good, it actually builds, like, I want to tell my own story now, you know, like, yeah. it definitely feel, feels like a positive fire. Yeah, and and so I think that that creates a fire, and then there's the reverse fire, which is like, the, the and I'm sure we've all known people like that, that are just yeah. a pile of negativity, and, and it's like, right. when you hear the complaint, it's followed by a complaint, and a complaint, and it just kind of, and I'll admit, like, in my life, I've had moments, like, like all the time I'll have a bad day and I want to complain about it, you know, but the weird thing is how much like that just kind of feeds itself and it becomes right. a fire that works in the reverse direction where it's like the last thing you want to do is make stuff because you're in a bad mood and bitter and like yeah. angry or whatever. So it's like, um, uh, you know, the, that's the beauty of it. Like to me, I, like I love going to conventions, even seeing stuff that I, I'm not into Right. and trying to find like what it is about it that's cool uh -huh. um and much less the fact that like like we all like once you've made a comic you just kind of respect anybody's finished one <laughs> yeah absolutely man you yeah know? yeah um, yeah and they'll, they'll like so i i pretty much spare that kind of thing for like our president that's one person i'm really critical of and then <laughs> outside of that like i'll i'll the only other negative i try to go to is like um, and this is more, maybe this is something I need to work on, but I really do have a problem with people who don't make stuff, but pretend they're making stuff. That's Dude, pretty much I, it. I could feel that, you know, cause yeah. I think it's, it's something that you have to earn, you know, like, and I don't often say that I make comics like as my first thing, like my, my bio is always, I'm an illustrator, designer, and occasionally a comic creator because that's really who I am <laughs> because I know how difficult that is and I don't often I don't take it lightly that that it's something that's easy to do so when other people feel like they can jump on this bandwagon of oh I make stuff too you know like it's to what degree though you know because I think yeah. like there's people that that I know personally that are that put in so much more time and effort and I and to, to lump yourself in with that I, I can understand that frustration when it when it's spoken about so easily yeah i but once again even that like i've also been that guy yeah. like i've also been that guy who was like yeah i'm i'm gonna be a cartoonist and like hadn't made anything so i mean we all start somewhere <laughs> right yeah so, so you know um and i i i'm sure this has been quoted before but i think it's just a general kind of it's it's like a trope that's true about getting started in illustration or graphic design or any art field or creative field, you have to be like slightly delusional. Mm -hmm. Cause like I, you know, when I first approached clients, I was nowhere prepared to have those clients. My portfolio was nowhere, not even comparable to the, the competitive, the people I was competing with. Right. Because when you enter it, you're competing with all the guys you look at. In like right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. 
you know, that didn't really register because I was a little naive. And I think so that helped me these embarrassing introductions with people and you still have to try. <laughs> oh yeah. You learn from them, but I definitely would, would cringe at the type of things I was going for or methods I was trying just to, to break in. Yeah. And, and, and it's important though. They're super learning experiences though, you know? Oh yeah. 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 So like, you know, there's a little delusion that's required, I think, to get into this whole thing, but, but, and probably even to convention, cause like you're, you know, just to booth at a table when like there's guests that have massive followings and who are you, you know? Mm -hmm. And, but, but that's, that's how, that's how it starts for everybody. But, but at, at the same time, like, um, so that's an, I, I just wanted to clarify, like, that's not what kind of I'm addressing with that kind of thing. Huh. Um, so, so I feel like we've kind of polished the surface of this a little bit. What do you think? You guys feel feel good? Yeah, I think we've gone got a couple hours over a couple oh, hours, wow. which is more than Jesus. It's so. tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> not. It always I wanna, I want to get a good look at what Scott's working on here. This is a cool scene. Oh yeah, we're talking about um, how long it takes to do a comic. I mean, you remember many comics in Uptrack. That was issue one. I'm working yeah. on issue four right now. So yeah. that tells you how long I, how long it takes me to put these things out. But, yeah. So this is one of my characters in a convenience store. And if you can see right here, uh -huh. we've got the old style spinner rack. So a little homage. It takes place in the 80s. So okay, yeah, know, yeah. I try to throw in a bunch of stuff. Like I think the last one, there was a can of slice. Remember that? <laughs> oh, I remember slice. slice. Yeah. The other, the other sprite, you know? Yeah. The yeah. <laughs> so I throw, I try to throw in a bunch of stuff like that, but yeah. Mm -hmm. so awesome. just flatting, which is so boring, but it's necessary, you know. It's, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Chris, what are you, what are you working on? And like, I also, I don't know if we've talked. Like, we'll have to, like, like I said, we'll have to have you back on at some point to talk about your illustrations and. Sure. storyboarding and like I mean you've done like pretty yeah much I mean I honestly I haven't done much storyboarding lately I mean that's definitely where I got a good chunk of my start professionally but yeah a lot of the stuff I've been doing has been on um, like key art you know for for like Netflix and and hopefully if they pick these because a lot of them they're, they're kind of explorers and kind of like test to see if they'll if they'll pull the trigger on some of these but if if they pick the one right if they pick the ones I'm working on, they might show up on some DVD covers and stuff like that in the future. But yeah, it's been pretty fun. But I mean, storyboard stuff. I mean, I do have the ex I've I have years of experience on it, but lately I haven't uh, kind of shifted from that to to more graphic design things. But um, yeah, no, for sure, I'd love to share more yeah, stuff as I do. Yeah, I mean, like I I just I would encourage everybody to like really check out the portfolio because, like I said, it's really diverse and um, and the the illustration skills and design skills that you have are really worth checking out, I think, and people would find inspiring. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, like, more to the point, like, it'd, it'd be cool to have you on to kind of address more of those targeted things that you have had experience with and, like, the current things you have experience with, too, but it's just impossible to, like, touch on all of that in, like, yeah. one, one show. And since WonderCon tomorrow, it just seemed like conventions were a really good one. Yeah, um, no, it could be fun. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I definitely want to touch on conventions after I do Phoenix Comic Con. That's in May, late May, because you know I'm trying so many, I'm going to try so many different things, and having been invited as opposed to having to pay my way and everything, that's kind of different. So yeah. I definitely want to touch on that when we get to that. So yeah, depending on Chris's schedule, I mean, I know he's usually pretty busy. Yeah. We've been having trying to have him on for a while. I know, like it feels like for years or something, you know, like you've been asking me and I keep on, yeah, I'm really glad I was finally able to, to jump in on one of these. It's, I've been kind of like lurking in the shadows for such a long time watching the show. <laughs> but like the cool thing, and this is the thing that like all creators know, it's like we're all kind of juggling a million plates. So just to get together is, is a complicated uh, task to make happen. So I appreciate you taking the time to be here and stuff. Okay. Um, so uh should we do you guys do you guys feel good about the convention you feel feel like we can we can wrap it yeah yeah i think so all yeah. right so so why don't we uh let everybody know where to find your work and chris since wondercon tomorrow this will be up tomorrow so uh mention your boot do you know your booth number yeah it, yeah I, I was just looking it up uh when we were looking at this it's c32 i believe cool yeah 
All right, and uh, that's WonderCon tomorrow. So tomorrow, that, that'll... Yeah, so Artist Alley uh, C32. Yeah. Yeah. So for for most of you, it's probably today, and I know like a lot of people who watch this probably are going to be at WonderCon. So that that would be good. Go go stop by Chris's booth, um, and it, if not for anything other than just like check out the setup, it's really cool. And like <laughs> the reason I mentioned the fortune teller thing. It's just that there's these beautifully like kind of handcrafted, awesome kind of things that that Chris just does because that's just part of who he is, and it's cool oh, yeah. to check out. There's, um, it's gonna be fun. There's some friends of the show that are gonna be here too. It's neat. Jer Jeremy Burley is gonna be there. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Tell him I said hi. I will. Yeah. Yeah. I was supposed to exhibit next to him because I uh -huh. did last time right. at Phoenix, but since they gave me a table, they're putting me with the they're putting me in different areas. Wow. So. It's like, you know, yeah. when kids are too loud in class, they separate them. They're... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are talking too much. You're gonna... <laughs> um, my, my sister yeah. does a, a vlog or a, a blog um, uh, called No Man's Land that's dedicated to, uh, to just entertainment, um, but, you know, women who are, you know, into geek culture and active in, uh, in the entertainment industry. And so she's going to be there, not the... Entertainment industry sounds really wrong, uh -huh. but the uh, you know the movie industry and stuff. So um, she's going to be there, like interviewing people and stuff. So if oh, if she comes cool. by your booth, say hi. Um, uh, my I sister in law. Saw the, the post she did for Mai right recently. Did she have a post for for Mai? Yeah, yeah, it was that really was cool. cool. Um, that was really yeah, awesome. She, yeah, yeah, That's she cool. interviewed my my wife about her kids' books and stuff, and she's interviewed like a lot of really interesting people, like people who run like the Jane Austen Society and all this really cool kind of geeky nerdy stuff um and then uh may my sister-in-law will be there as well like repping art supply warehouse so yeah. uh yeah and then there's a bunch of cartoon like pretty like like we were saying it's a small little little world so it is yeah um so, all right uh so chris where can everybody find your work so it's uh chris .com, but i think it's probably easier to just look up sketchboy01 on pretty much everything instagram facebook and Twitter. Nice. And yeah, um, Chris also has like a bunch of just badass, awesome t-shirts. So check it out. Um, yeah, I got Chris, oh, I was going to say, I was gonna say, Chris, I follow you on Instagram. So make sure you take pictures of your booth because I want to check I it out. Yeah. <laughs> I always have to remember to do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so as far as me, uh, you can find me at CircWorks.com, CircWorks on YouTube. I am currently doing the March of Robots Challenge, so if you hit me up on Instagram or Vero or Facebook or Twitter, you can see that stuff. Nice. All right. Um, did we mention where people can, can sign up for the show? Oh, no, I forgot, sir. Okay. Yeah, right. so the way this thing works is we rotate between the Asha channel and my channel, and uh, sometimes we do it on different days. So if you want to know exactly when and where we're going to do it, we do have a newsletter, and there's a link in the description. You can click on that, and we don't spam you or anything. We just try to send a little notice out about 30 minutes at least ahead of time to let you know uh, where we're going to be, whose channel, and... Uh, just click on the link and you'll be able to find it. Awesome. And then I'm just going to tack this little bit on at the end because I do not want to edit another video tonight. Um, <laughs> so this is also my day 70 of the 100 Days of Making Comics Challenge. So um, what I'm working on right now is my thumbnails uh, for the next page of Quarterly Stories, which I've been finding really distracting because I really love uh, talking. Like, Two of my favorite people is fun to talk to. So, yeah. um, but, uh, but that will be completed and posted to Instagram tonight. And thanks to those of you who've, who've like been in the chats. And uh, sorry if we didn't get to your question. But the cool thing about the chats to keep in mind is as you're watching this live, you can now watch the chats live as well with the videos, which is a really cool component. Um, so uh, you know, we'll see you guys next week. And uh, I hope you guys have a good week. I hope those of you who go to WonderCon have a good time. So all right. Thanks for being on the show, Chris. And we'll, Thank you. Yay. Yeah. It was fun. Yeah, it was. All right, and we'll see you guys uh, next week. All right, later. Yeah.